Mr. Ryan Hoover, how are you doing, brother? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. The weather is shit. For the rest, of we're all good, man. <laughs> it's a little chilly here, but it's it's nice and sunny, so I'll take it. That's good, man. That's the thing. That's the amazing thing I see every time I interview one uh, one of you guys across the pond. Yeah, most of you have got amazing weather, and I'm like, that's one thing I'm really starting to get sick and tired of that because it's gray, it's raining, it's cold, it's windy. And I, I've seen worse. I mean, when I was living in Glasgow in uh, in Scotland, that was even worse. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't do cold. I, I'm. I'm. <laughs> I'm not a fan of cold. Like. I'm I'm in the southeast and I'm about as far, far north as I would ever go. You know, yeah. I, I, this is about my my northern limit in terms yeah. of living somewhere. Yeah, for me, man, I grew up in Eastern Europe, man. So we had like minus twenty five, minus thirty in winter, but yeah, the no. summer was great. The summer yeah. was better than the summer we have here. I've I've taught in Alaska a couple of times. Yeah. Um, Always during the summer, of course, because I'm not. <laughs> there's about two months out of the year that I would go to Alaska, um, and you know that I, I talk to the guys that are hosting there. I do, and um, it'll be October, November, whatever, and they're like, "Yeah, you know, the, with the windshield, it's minus 80. and I'm like, "That's not like humans should not live there. Like, that's not a thing. <laughs> that's like, like, like." planet hoth or something from star wars like who lives in places like that uh, have you seen snow piercer no i haven't i know who, what you're talking about no, i haven't seen uh, it. it's not too bad man so do you, do you want to give us like a little introduction uh, about you who you are what you've been doing what you're doing sure. um so i'm ryan hoover uh, i'm the owner of fit to fight um we're a training organization um, I own a couple of training centers here in North Carolina, and then we have, you know, a few affiliates kind of mostly in the Southeast or the on the East Coast, but um, a, a little outside of that. And, you know, for the most part, we we run classes and, and uh, courses here and um, travel and teach seminars, you know, um, mostly anything kind of remotely touching violence we, we mostly deal with. Okay. Okay. So do you, do you, do you deal with the, the actual f physical application of violence or do you also speak about the soft skills, the, the awareness aspect of things, the, the de-escalation tactics, the, the mindset, all that stuff, stuff that you speak about as well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we, we try to touch on as much of it as we can. Um, I, I, I will say I'm a pretty strong believer and I, and I, I think I maybe heard Chad Lyman say this first, but I'm not, I, I can't say for sure, um, which he would be another good guest for you to talk to. Um, Who's that? Chad Lyman. Uh, Chad I'll, Lyman. See, I'll see his information. Um, he's a police officer out in Las Vegas, but really good dude. Um, and it, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but basically, you know, it was it, it's very difficult to de-escalate if you don't have the physical skills to back, back it up. And, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty big believer in that. It's hard to now, there are exceptions, of course. Like, there are people that are just really good talkers, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But when it comes to, to violence, um, I, am, I am more prepared to de-escalate someone the more comfortable I am dealing with going hands-on if I need to. So my soft skills are amplified by my hard skills, um, I think. Yeah. So I can I'm, – I'm much more – I don't know if relax is the, the right word, but if, if we're in a, a, a confrontation and you're close to me and you're yelling at me, screaming at me, whatever, you know, whatever the context is that, that brought us there, um, my ability to go hands on um, greatly enhances my ability to stand there and be calm and relaxed and not allow yeah. that external to, to, to affect me internally so much that I immediately jump to an emotional reaction, which may make the situation worse not better yes. um so while we do you know we talk about situational awareness which i think in this industry a lot of times it's just kind of a we got to be careful it's a bit of a buzzword that people throw out there and then there's like no substance to it it's like well okay but what does that mean to the average person you know yeah. situational awareness people say that but then okay well what does that mean and then you know i the 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 de-escalation side of things too again it's 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 often talked about but I don't see people like 
training it. Now, part of that yeah. might be just, you know, it's not sexy for social media. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. play well on an Instagram video. Um, so I, I get, I get that part of things. The, 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 the think about awareness, obviously, like, you know, it's a broad term when people speak about situational awareness, but you got, you got so many different types of awareness. I mean, generally, when I teach, I speak about personal awareness to know yourself, know what you're capable of, how you deal under pressure, how you deal with adrenaline, how, you fa how you're facing fear, what you're capable of, how far you're ready to go, all that stuff. And then you go environmental awareness, which is, you know, kind of really knowing, mapping the place, drawing an environmental map every time you get somewhere, knowing, you know, covers and, and hiding place and what could yep. stop a bullet and what you could use as a weapon, you know, all, all that sort of things. And then you have situational awareness, which is the situation around you, who is around you, who is big enough to fight, who's got the cauliflower ears and a big flat nose and a big jaw, uh, you know, who's, who, who's got a big jacket on in, in summer, that's a bit right. weird. Uh, right. And then you've got behavioral awareness, which is really now looking at uh, behavioral study and how pe body language and being able to spot all, all, you know, anomalies in body language and all that. So awareness is a big, it's a massive topic, but I feel that people are not speaking about it enough. And that, that's the thing. It's, it's very important to actually touch on it. Yeah, I, I, I really think it's go, go to go watch any fight video on, on YouTube or Instagram or whatever. Yeah, and, and, and you'll hear, like, you'll see comment after comment after comment, situational awareness, situational awareness, situation. but okay, but what, what does that mean? What am I, what am I being aware of? What am I looking for? You know? Um, Cause I think for the average person and, and for me, when we talk about self-defense, self-protection, fighting, what, whatever combatives, whatever name we want to give to it. Um, I'm mostly interested in, in, the regular person, the, the average dude yeah. that just wants to get from point A to point B in his life, not be fucked with, you know, like I just want to go from dropping my kids off at school to work and back home again. Um, and, and so to that guy or that, that, that girl, like just saying situational awareness doesn't have much meaning, you know, yeah. um, that they're, they're more concerned with, um, making sure that their kids have have what they need for lunch and school and, and whatever and picking up their dry cleaning, you know, like, so just saying it's, I, I think, and, and I, I think it's maybe twofold. One, um, some, some coaches, some instructors kind of assume that people know what it means. But then beyond that, I think a lot of instructors and coaches don't know what it means themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's easy to just throw it out there and then nobody questions you on it. So mm. You don't have to like well, that's that's the thing that's about the depth in which you can actually go into your subject that's what makes a good instructor you know it's like how deeply in in that subject can you go so for example you know with with situational awareness there are various drills actually that you can give to your students like the cross and check drill you know like who sees you can i did i see that person first or did that person see me first right. Or, uh, you know, sit at the terrace of a cafe like I used to do with my old man when I was younger. And he we would observe different archetypes, different types of people. Where is the alpha male? Where is the, the group leader? Where is the guy, the followers? Where is the mices, you know, alpha, beta, gamma? Where, where is the... Um, same thing, you know, who, who is, who is big enough to fight or we would, we would look at uh, plate numbers and we would try to make uh, words with letter with the letters, you know, we would try to make yep. funny words. And yep. so all things to make your mind move and look left, look right before you cross the road. That's something we've been taught from a very young age before you right. cross the road. But what about look left and right when you get out of your home? Look yep. left and right before you get in your car, which are the, the, the places where you're most likely to, to, to be assaulted if somebody wanted to do something bad to you. Right. So th these are all stuff that, yeah, if, if you can actually give drills to your students where now they're like, ah, this is what situational awareness is. This is how we put it in place. This is how we, so, so you do, do you do that as well? Well, I'm sure you do, but. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it's a constant, I think for group classes, for example, um, because again, it goes back to like what, what, what's cool and sexy and, you know, I, yeah. it, because I mean, the reality is if we wanted to talk about things that people really need to, to know in their daily lives, um, we could go out and run sprints in the parking lot, you know, because seven times out of 10, I, I think, especially when it's a, a dude and another dude, somebody could just 
run away, <laughs> just, just leave, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's not cool. It's not fun to train. You know, it, 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 it doesn't make for great social media fodder. Um, and so I think as a, as a coach, you have to figure out ways to do things like the drills you're talking about in a way that still is challenging, but, um, some level of, of engaging and, and fun for people. It's like, it's like teaching kids. I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference in teaching kids and teaching adults. Um, adults get bored really easily. Um, a, adults, um, are, are constantly looking for the next thing to do, you know, um, attention and, span. Yeah. that's right. And, and so as, as a coach, we have to, to be mindful of that and, and walk that line between giving them things that are, are realistic based in, in reality, if that's what we say our goals are for the training, yeah. um, but then also making it, um, enjoyable to do because if it, if it, if it just, is a day to day grind and it sucks. And, you know, you're constantly scaring the hell out of your students. People will find something else to do. Oh yeah. yeah. Like I, I know at, at my training center in Charlotte, you know, people might drive because of traffic, they might drive 45 minutes to get there. Well, if they're only taking an hour class and now they got to drive another 30 minutes home or whatever, they're spending as much or more time in their car to do it than they are actually training. And so if, Every time they come there, somebody's yelling at them like they're in, in the military. Yeah. They got veins popping out of their head and their red face and they're wearing BDUs and, you know, all this kind of shit. And yeah. they'll find something else to do. You know, um, it, it, it's not it, it's, a, it's a thing to enhance their lives, but it's not their lives. You know, they, they, most people are it's, it's no different than going to the gym, you know. That they're going to go lift their weights or, or run on their treadmill or whatever. And it's, it's, it's a way to enhance their life, but it, it's not who they are. Yeah. You know? Go back to their life after that. Yeah. That's right. The, most people are not like us. They don't, they don't live in this, this world. And I think as a, as a coach, a lot of times it's easy for us to forget that. Um, and, and again, if, if we want to reach the people that really need what it is that we do, they're the least likely to actually do it. So we have to find that balance between being real and, and also it being an enjoyable activity for people. Yeah. Uh, if it's, if it's, if it's all daunting and scary and, and, and skulls and crossbones and daggers and flames and shit, you know, um, yeah. the people that really need it are never going to come into there. And if they do, they're not staying. It's, it's, it, it's interesting what you're saying because I'm, it's something I'm going through right now in my life. You know, I've been training with a lot of different people. Uh, I became an instructor under Lee Morrison as well, which is like, it's, it's proper hardcore stuff. Yep. But at the same time, it's not for everyone. Right. And I'm asking myself, how do I actually present a product to people, uh, for people that really need it? And not only the angry, uh, bold half a male uh, with the tattoos that wants to hit shit hard. Which I mean, we, I mean, I, I was gonna say we all love to hit shit hard. No, that's not true. We don't all love to hit no. shit hard. I do, and yeah. I know a lot of people that do, and it, it's cool. It's cool as long as we are honest about the fact that okay, I love, I love combatives. I love to do that. I love to mm -hmm. pressure test. I love, I love to go full contact pressure testing. All that stuff is great. But how do I? present a product to Mr. and Madam Everyone, the people that are not, uh, that cannot hit hard, the people that cannot grapple, that cannot uh, strike properly, how do we actually uh, give them a chance to survive the, the this, this sort of encounter, which very often, let's just face it, it is statistically most of violence occurred within within our own circle. It's either uh, domestic violence or it's, uh, you know, rarely it's going to be uh, the killer following you in the back, in the dark alley. Like that, that's that's just the, the thing that we tell ourselves, but that's just not how it works. So that, that's interesting you're saying that because at the end of the day, you want to find a product that you want to find a way to help everyone. The people that really need it are those that don't know how to fight. So yes. I'm, I'm slowly coming to terms with this, bro. It's kind of uh, yeah. it, it's a it's a difficult um, kind of conundrum to find yourself in as a coach because mm. you you have to walk this line between what you know people need and yeah. 
how to how to find the way to deliver it to them that doesn't immediately just put them off. Um, your 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 training like even even from the way you answer the phones it, like we, we run full time training center, but you know I, I I understand that I'm not like every trainer or coach out there. Um, but from the way people answer their phone, like I look at it like this, if a 35 year old female accountant contacts us, she wants to learn self-defense. Yeah. Well, I, I think probably she's gone to my website and maybe four or five other websites three or four times before she called us or sent that email. Um, she, she corresponded back and forth a few times. Maybe she sat on that for a couple of weeks or a month or more. She finally decides to come in and take a take a lesson. So she she comes in by the time she walks that door. I'm saying she, it could be we 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 look people of all walks of life, um, mm -hmm. which I think is super important. Um, it, it, along with the conversation we're having right now, um, but I look at it like by the time she walks through our door, she's already done three or four things that were uncomfortable for her. And so he goes through that and then walks into my door and it's not a welcoming environment. It, it's, you know, again, all the, all the aesthetics that tend to go around the reality based self-defense world. Um, I don't think I'm doing her a good, a good service, you know? Um, yeah. Now, ultimately I have to deliver on the, on the mats, you know, I have to deliver realistic training, Yeah. but it, it, it can't immediately be, you know, just, scary as fuck because again the people that really need it they're not going to do that that's why they need it <laughs> you know yeah, the people that yeah. the people that don't really need it they're going to be drawn to that which is mm -hmm. fine i don't have any problems with with those folks coming to my training center as well um but if i and and the people that run my centers can tell you this if i walk in to my center and i look in a class and i see like there's 15 people in there and 13 of them are, are dudes i'm like where the hell are all the women? Because yeah. I look at it like if if like I we aim for 50-50. Now sometimes yeah. it's 60 40 one way, 60 40 the other. Um, but if we're if we're getting the vast majority of, of young adult athletic males for a self-defense program, yeah. we're not doing something right. We're we're, we're not messaging our product in a, in a proper way we're not delivering it the right way on the mats something because and again not not that i don't want those folks in my my centers i do um but if if my goal and it is is to reach people that really need what it is that we do and you know you said it already if we looked at the statistics it's pretty easy to identify those folks then i need to make sure that we're delivering that and if i look around and I've got a bunch of dudes that played linebacker in college. I'm not. I, I'm not reaching the right people. Yeah. So it's 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 all about marketing as well. You know, when I that's one thing I've started to realize as well is how do you market yourself? How do you put the message across? Is one thing. What what is your image? And you know, for quite a while, I've been. Uh, kind of influenced by 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 other people you know people that i respect i got a lot of people in this in this sphere that i respect you're one of them man and uh you know some before i was i was more influenced in a way like oh because i didn't trust myself you know it's also inner work what we do sure. is about inner work and when you start developing a skill set and you you know you start realizing oh i can actually fucking fight you know i can actually do something and now it just calms you down. It's the same like when I did a bit of Thai boxing and I stepped on the ring. I had a few fights here and there. And I was like, oh, you know, I actually uh, did more than survives. That was good. So at that point, it's like you don't want to put this mean face on all the time and go right. everywhere and go like the fucking Terminator scanning at everyone. You're like, right, this is not who I am. This is not who I am. I am that smiley person, clownish, uh, eccentric, extrovert. That's me, Julian. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, that's who I should be. And at the end of the day, you know, that's what people want to see. Somebody that's approachable, somebody that's smiling, somebody that they can relate to. And uh, that, that I'm, I'm getting to that. So I'm getting to that slowly as my marketing tactics as well and how I market myself. And uh, yeah, so that, that, well, that's all important. Yeah, that, that, that was one of my biggest, you know, I... I... I spent a good bit of time with a pretty large Krav Maga organization, um, and I was yeah. I was pretty pretty involved with them. 
And uh, that was one of my biggest kind of takeaways um, was almost a negative demonstration and that I would, I would not just go through their coach courses, but I ran some of their coach courses for them. I, I, I ran instructor courses for them. And by and large, it was big, strong athletic people that would pass those courses. Um, they were already aggressive. They were already strong. They were already um, of a certain mindset mentality. Yeah. But what they weren't was representative of the average person that comes into my center. Um, and, and so not that they, they couldn't coach those people, but I think having people in your training center that brand new folks can relate to is, is important because at the end of the day, they're going to look at, they're going to look at somebody like you and they're going to be like, well, yeah, of course he can do it. You know, he's done this, 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 he's big, strong, athletic, whatever. But what can he get me to do? You know, mm -hmm. and I, I've, I've taught in probably a hundred different training centers around the world. Um, and it's super rare that when I go to somebody's center, I will watch them. I watch their, their students. Cause I don't really give a shit what you can do. Yeah. What can you get? What can you get the regular folks to do? What can you get the people that really need your service to do? Can you take that person? Not only have they never thrown a punch in their lives, they never thought about hitting another human being in their lives. Can you take that person and, and get them from point A to point B, get them to understand the gravity of the circumstance and stay with you and, and be able to execute under, under pressure. Mm. I, I expect you to be able to do those things. It, yeah. that, that, it's your job, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but the hard part of what we do is to get other people to be able to do that. You know, I, I, I walked in with a certain mindset and mentality. I work, walked in as somebody that had had an athletic background my, my, most of my life. And, and I think a lot of instructors are that way. Um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really make much difference what I can do. Um, I, I, you know, if you, if you look at all uh, major sports, um, a lot of the really good coaches, some of the best coaches, they were not the, the greatest players. They may not have even been very good. Yeah. Um, and then if you look at the flip side of that, the, the best coaches haven't made the best or the best players haven't made the best coaches, you know, because mm -hmm. um, they have a much more difficult time relating to the average person. You know, yeah. I, I guarantee you, Michael Jordan is not a great coach. I, I, yeah. I, I'm willing to bet because he's going to look at you and he's going to be like, well, Julian, just jump from the free throw line. Uh, yeah. know? Like, OK, but I can't do that. <laughs> expecting expecting uh, you to have the same attributes as him. Yeah. Right. And so if you look at and just to use it and to stay with the basketball analogy for a minute, if you look at somebody like Steve Kerr, who was a bench player with a lot of the great Chicago Bulls teams. He's become a, an amazing coach um, yeah. because he didn't have the same athletic attributes as a lot of players like a Jordan would have. So he had to really understand the nuances of the game, the principles, the concepts, the, 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 the application of, of those things and how they relate. And, and by having that kind of ownership, he could relate that to other people. Yeah. If, if if you don't have to go through that process yourself, it's very difficult for you to take somebody else through it. It's it's true, you know. And when I, when I think about very, very often, you know, I try because I'm that sort of person. I'm very much into personal development, which which we can talk about later on. But it, it, for me, it's all about how can I become a better instructor? How can I convey the message better? How can I simplify things? How can I adapt to uh, the different individual learning styles and different people out there? And I'm like, okay, so as an instructor, first of all, well, you know, you got to be able to do it. That's the thing. You, you, you need to be able to do it. And I, that's why I think that it's always a good idea uh, to actually seek a real life experience. That's why I go work the doors. Uh, that's why, you know, I do close protection. I do, I do a few bits and pieces here and there to, to be exposed to adrenaline, to be exposed to violence, to be exposed to that stuff so that I know that I know how I react. I know my reaction so that I can go right. This is what happens. This is how you deal with it. 
Right. And that's just the technical side and the mental and psychological and emotional mm -hmm. preparation of it. And then there is the actual methodology, teaching methodology and pedagogy that, that we use to convey the message. And, and that's also another thing because you see a lot of people, uh, a lot of instructors that are good at what they do. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes to explaining stuff, they're not very articulate and uh, they, they can't really explain stuff. So I look at somebody like uh, my, my mentor, Lee, uh, Lee Morrison, who's, who's a, a guy that can do it, but also very, very articulate. You know, and that's one thing that always attracted me because he can explain it and he can do it. You look at... Um, I, mean, I don't. I don't want to give no names, but there are some people that there are some people that are really good at what they do. Great martial athletes. They can bang. They can make it. They can make it happen. When it comes to explaining it and break it down and find the formula to actually break it down in a concise and precise way, in a way that's uh, easily digestible, they can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's it's, yeah. it's the um, knowledge does not equal understanding. Kind yeah. of, you know, just because you know how to do something doesn't mean that you really understand the why behind yeah. it. Um, there's, there's a great example of this, and I posted this video a couple of weeks ago, I think. Um, there were some engineers that came up with a back, what they called a backwards bicycle. And basically, it was, it was designed to where if you turn the handlebars to the left, the bicycle would go right. If you turn the handlebars to the right, the bicycle would go left. So you and I right now already understand it print in, in concept, right? Mm. I, I understand. Okay. If I turn this, the, the handlebars this way, it's going to go that way. The problem is when I go to actually try to apply that because I've done it a certain way my entire life. And so just because I have that now knowledge doesn't mean that I can apply it in, in, in real time. Um, one of the guys that, that did this experiment, he took this bicycle to college campuses, just kind of toured around. And he offered $200 to anybody that could, could ride this bicycle for 10 feet. Nobody could do it. And during his journey, he took five minutes a day um, practicing on this bicycle. It took him eight months at five minutes a day to be able to competently ride this backwards bicycle. He gave it to his, his six-year-old son who had been riding a bicycle for three years. <clears throat> it took him two weeks. Mm. Fresher hard oh. drive. Yes. The, the, the neuroplasticity of the brain is, is so hardwired at, at, over time. It is mm. very difficult to just let go of that. So you can understand how a thing works but not be able to, to apply it. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and if you can't apply it or if you can't, if, if you don't really have ownership of it, there's no way you can transfer that to somebody else. You know, if you don't really own it, if you can't really do it, then you can't do, um, what it takes to get somebody else to do it. Like it just, yeah. that, that, that defies logic. You, you need you need to understand the inner mechanics of, of each things and that's what I was saying earlier you need to be able to dive deep into your subject so that people are like okay you know because for some people you're gonna you're just gonna scratch the surface and they are they're gonna understand straight away because they got a basic understanding of what you're talking about already and then some people have got absolutely no idea of what you're talking about now you're gonna have to really dive in right. uh, you know to get that to 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 hook that information, you know, to imprint that information in, in their brain. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the flip side of that is if, if we took somebody that had never ridden a bicycle before ever, yeah. well, they're going to learn how to ride the, bi the backwards bicycle a lot faster, mm. but they don't, they don't have anything. Program. Yeah. If, if I have a guy that comes into my training center and he's boxed his whole life, I love boxing. Yeah. I think it's great. Uh, boxing is amazing, um, mate. But, but if I try to just, okay, man, I want you to stand this way versus the way that you've been standing for 20 years in boxing, that's going to take some, some real time. And the first time that dude gets really cracked, he's going to go back to the, to the stance that he knows and is familiar with. And he's not going to think anything about it. Um, and, but if I take somebody that's never done anything before, they're a blank slate, 
um, they don't have to reprogram anything. Mm. You know? So that part, at least that part of the process is going to be faster for them. The physical side, the rest of it, though, is going to be harder because I don't have to, to teach them. Look, if you get punched in the face, it's not the worst thing in the world. You know, I do have to teach them that like I'm they're, they're going to be daunted. The, the boxer is not going to care about this. You know, the boxer is not going to care about getting punched in the face. That's what he does. The average person is like, fuck that. I don't want to get punched in the face. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not paying somebody to punch me in the face. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's the brain, man. It, 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 it's an interesting thing that we don't really know a whole lot about, I think, you know, and, and, and so being able to, um, break old habits is really hard to do. And then they still stay right underneath the surface. You know, yeah. you take a really guy, you take a guy that's wrestled his whole life, you throw him in an <clears throat> MMA fight, and for the past six months he's been doing nothing but Muay Thai. The first yeah. time that dude gets rocked, he's shooting a double leg. <laughs> you know, like yeah. he, he's like, not kicking. What's on the disc is what comes out, and it? it's it's so much more difficult to get rid of a bad habit than to learn a new one from the start. Yeah. And you know, it's it's like them the process that you go through where you go through Un unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence to conscious competence to conscious right. uh to unconscious competence and then mastery yeah. on the top of it and then you get to that uh, when you're in difficulty because you're learning something new automatically you go back to what you know yeah. and uh yeah yeah that's that that, I, that happened to me that still happens to me when oh, i yeah. learn new stuff and it's it, it gets all of us i mean we're all human and you know at the end of the day we're, we we all have very similar kind of of uh, framework to deal with, you know, and, and things that we're going to have to push through. And that's why, like, for the most part, um, from a teaching standpoint, from a from a, a pedagogy standpoint, I we, we come at it from a very Socratic kind of 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 methodology. You know, I I give my students a template, an outline, a framework. Um, but I don't spoon feed, feed the information to them. You know, mm -hmm. I, I need for them. And, you know, I, if, if, if somebody shows me a, a better way tomorrow, then I, I, I will happily adopt it. But the same, I need yeah. for them to have ownership of the material. I don't I don't want them to do A, B, C, D, E, F, because I told them to do A, B, C, D, E, F. Yeah. Because as soon as 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 B is now S, they're screwed because they, they they don't know how to, to to get outside of that syllogistic kind of thinking um and and so i think my my our process takes longer um mm. to get somebody you know to to a level of competency um because they're not being spoon fed but yeah. i think <clears throat> at the at the end of that journey whatever that means um they have real ownership of the material you know it's yeah. not just been regurgitated um to them from from somebody that uh, that gave it to me and now i'm giving it to them and you know th th this kind of thing it's a, it's a, it's a bit like the difference between teaching someone what to think versus teaching someone how to think yeah and then that, that that's a big difference i mean I, I i think of that with the educational system in the world you know they teach our kids what to think and not how to think Right. I mean, you need to pay, you need to, to go to a really good university for your kids now to learn how to think yeah. as opposed to what to think. So, yeah, no, it's for, for sure. And and then it, that brings us to um, the difference between the technical mind and the conceptual mind of yeah. the codified technique. Uh, you know, like we all started with traditional martial arts. I mean, I, I will ask you in a bit what, what you started with. Sure. I know I've, I've started with the Japanese traditional martial art, judo and, and karate, uh, you know, Kyuko Shinkai karate and then taekwondo. So, and it was all like, I mean, taekwondo was already much more sport orientated than the uh, the first style of karate and the, and the judo that I did. Uh, it was very codified. So there was a block for each, especially the first style of karate that I did that I didn't like. I, I very quickly went to Kyuko Shinkai instead uh, because I wanted to go to contact. But, you know, it was... It was a block for a certain strike. It was, basically, it was too codified. It's like, how how are you, you know, you're, you're using the OODA loop, for example. You know, you got to go OODA to understand what's happening before you before you go, you, you perform your action. You have to or observe, orient, decide. 
you're never going to have the time to you want to that's why i believe in a, a size t-shirt that fits that fits all pretty much like a universal way of doing stuff and so i was in that mindset of I'm going to accumulate. I'm going to, I'm going to learn a new technique. I would get like excited. Yes. I'm going to learn a new technique. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And before I knew it, I found myself with a massive toolbox full of techniques. And, and I realized that when I had to spar, when I went to Kyoko Shinkai for the first time, I, I was getting my ass handed over to me because, uh, because what all we were doing was punching just a few punches, just a few kicks. And that yeah. was it. There was none of all that, all that crap. That was more like sparring. That was more like combat sports than, than traditional martial arts. And that's when I started to understand, right, there's too many tools in my toolbox. And then obviously that was layer by layers because I went to train with different people. And one person that really made me understand that was Tommy Carruthers from uh, uh, Scotland. Uh, and, you know, and then you start thinking in terms of, right, concept, principles, that every single technique is reflecting a certain concept and principle, be it high to low principle, you know, fake on, fake on the high line to set the low line or fake on the low line to set the high line, uh, head hunting or, uh, you know, t take, it, take his eyes, breath, mobility. All, all, all that stuff was conceptual based. And when I started to understand that, it freed so much space on the hard drive that I could put more stuff on the hard drive. And now I was like, I'm not putting any more techniques on the hard drive. I'm just going to add um strategies and tactics and concepts and principles in there that's it you know and yeah, the yeah. will follow yeah it's it's i i understand why why uh, most systems um do it that way um and, and you know some of it's a business thing i mean I, oh, yeah, yeah. Let, let's just be real i mean some of it is yeah the the, the if, if i have this very codified curriculum that I can I can illustrate to you. Okay, from from this point to this point, you memorize these things that gets you to this rank. You pay this much, and and so on and so on and so on. Um, I need a whole lot of techniques to be able to fill that curriculum, so I can keep you here as as long as absolutely possible. And then I can tell you, okay, once you get your black belt, that's when the real learning starts. You know, it's like wait a minute, <laughs> I just spent five years like learning all this shit. Now Stop what? Learning now. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and so like for, for, for us, the thing that I, I, I say pretty often is like, once you really understand the rules, once you really have, have ownership of the rules, then you can start to break them. You know, yeah. you, you have a really good understanding of, of why the principles are what they are, why, you know, they, yes. And then you can start kind of making it your own because at the end of the day, everybody is a little bit differently. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I'm five foot seven, 155 pounds. I'm not going to fight the same way as somebody that's six to 195. It, it, it wouldn't make any sense for me to, and it wouldn't make any sense for them to fight the same way that I fight. Yeah. But if we both understand the concepts, the principles, because those just are what they are. They don't, they don't change. Um, then I can kind of, of, of make it my own. Um, yeah. it's like I, I, Roger Gracie, who was one of the best jujitsu competitors ever. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what, what he said, but basically he said, get really good at six things, you know? Um, he knows hundreds or thousands of, of techniques, but he said, get really good at six things. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, he finished most of his fights with a cross collar choke. One choke, and everybody knew it was coming. <laughs> he was so good at it; they 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 couldn't stop it. You know, it would, it, and, it would make you believe he's going for something else, so that you start yeah. defending it and opening, so that you, you, you right, yeah. absolutely. And 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 so it goes back to what you were saying about you know when you're sparring and and I think Jeff Thompson said one time, you know, the things that that really work, you write on the back of a postage stamp. Well, if you if you look at UFC. For example, um, because we have statistics that, that 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 show, you know, the top four or five submissions, I don't remember the numbers, um, make up the vast majority of finishes. You know, it's, it's straight arm bar, rear naked choke, guillotine, triangle, boom, done. You know, like, and, and, and these are all things that a white belt in jiu-jitsu learns. Mm. 
It's just, and, and, and they're being performed against the best in the world. It's because they're, they're, there's only a handful of things that, that really work under stress and under pressure. And if you get really good at them and you understand how to apply them when the dynamics of a situation change, then you, you greatly improve your, or enhance your, your chances of survivability. Um, if I, if I have, if we take the karate example, for, if I have a hundred different techniques for a hundred different problems, so I have a hundred problems, I have a hundred solutions. Well, one, I'm never going to be able to perform them in real time because most people do not have the time to devote to getting really good at a hundred different solutions for a hundred different problems. And then two, what happens when it's the hundred and first problem? Now, what do I do? Cause you didn't teach me that, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I need a new technique for that. If I need a new technique for every problem, that's not a good system. That's not a good program. I'll never have the time or the resource to actually access what you need at the moment when you need it. No, no, we're just not built that way. We're not. We're not going to remember it. We're not going to, you know, under stress. And you know, the other thing from a teaching standpoint, and I tell my coaches this all the time: like when you get up in front of a group of people, let's say you're teaching for an hour. Well, whatever you've decided to teach for that hour, you have prioritized over everything else. So. These people are coming to you, they're spending their money, they're spending their time, they're not, you know, they're away from their family, they had to go through traffic, wh whatever it is. And so in that hour, you've, you've picked these three, four, five things to teach. You've decided that in that moment, those things are more important than anything else you could have taught. Mm. So make sure that you're, you're, being efficient and mindful and respectful of their time. If, if you're teaching, you know, spinning back kicks in a self-defense program, really that's the best way you could, you could spend your, your students time today. Now, if you're doing it for fun, you know, you, you, you want to have some fun in a class or it's a sparring class and you've got more advanced people. Sure. Do all that shit, have fun with it. Mm -hmm. um, but, but be honest about what we're doing and, and what we're showing. You, you said something about the blocks and, and sparring a minute ago. You know, I, again, I spent a lot of time with Krav Maga and I, I started asking, okay, well, you know, the, the, the 360 blocks is very similar to karate kind of stuff. Yep. I said, okay, well, how many times in sparring do you do that? None. Nobody ever does it. Well, why not? Well, because I'm fucking open as shit when I do that. <laughs> like, it, 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 it's, it's just not, it's not practical. Why don't they do that in boxing? Why don't they do that in Thai boxing? Why don't they, you know, because it's not the most efficient way to do it. It's not the most effective way to do it. Well, sport's not street. Okay. I, I will give you that to a degree. Um, however, if, if I had the choice, I'm, let's say tomorrow, I'm going into a really shitty part of town and I know the likelihood of, of there being some sort of, of violent confrontation is pretty high. And I get to pick a guy that was a division one wrestler, or I get to, to pick the guy that is a five year instructor in some reality based self defense system. Just I'm generic. Okay. I'm going to pick the guy that's wrestled. Because I know that dude every day, all day, touched hands and and had people trying to to murder him, and he was doing the same. And he's not going to be afraid. He's not going to be daunted. He's not going to be scared. Um, I I don't know that about generic reality based self defense instructor guy. Yeah, I, I just don't. It's 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 true. You know, it's true what you're saying. And I, you know, as you evolve. Uh, for example, as I evolve, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at the different people I train with, the different stuff I train, and I'm starting to tell, well, I'm starting, I've been starting to tell myself that for quite a while, but there are things that give you a base, you know, and I, and I always said, you, you need a grappling base, you need a striking base, that is the base, then on the top of that, you sprinkle the dirty shit on the top of it, biting, gouging, all that, all that stuff, because uh, a lot of people, and there are a lot of Krav Maga people like that out there, they're like, we train for the street. These guys are training for the sport. And I'm like, dude, have you ever been in a ring? You know what I mean? The first yeah. time I stepped on the ring, 
uh, I, I, I didn't do bad, to be honest with you. You know, I did more than surviving, which was good. But yeah. I, I rewatched the video after and I was like, dude, I couldn't even hear my, my coach shouting at me. He was giving me instruction. I couldn't even fucking hear him. Right. I was too much into it. And, and so, you know, like ring fighting will definitely give you some attributes that you, you need them. If you want to call yourself a fighter, a warrior or, or an instructor, you need to step on the ring at least, uh, you know, at least a good 10, 20 times so that you know, you know what it is. You know how you function uh, when you're adrenalized. Uh, you know how it feels like to be taken to the ground and slammed and, you know, somebody just knocking the wind out of you. How it yeah. feels like when you're about to get choked out, or all the all the stuff, you know, it's not only about learning how to fight, but learning how to be on the receiving end of it. And that is something that a lot of instructor lack is can you take a punch? Right. Can you actually, you know, take a punch? Can you get get to the floor and get out of it? And 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 I think that comes down to a lot of like emotional toughness, you yeah. know. Um, because I mean physically, look, be no, nobody's gonna gonna ever begrudge being strong and fit in a fight like it, you know nobody nobody's ever gonna be like man I, I spent too much time in the gym or spent too much time in the ring or whatever after a fight they're gonna do like what you did and they're gonna look back and think man i could have done this or i could have done this or why didn't i do that or you know mm -hmm. those kinds of things um so so being strong and fit and all these things matter for sure. Um, unlike what traditional martial arts will tell you, you know, size doesn't matter and all that dumb shit. But um, the emotional toughness side of things is, can I take that punch and push through, keep going? Can I, can I be afraid and still go? You know, um, I, I get put on my back and do, do I, do I turtle up? Or, you yeah. know, do I, do I get my frames and I, I, I go to work? Do I treat the ground like it's lava <laughs> or, or, you know, like, yeah. or, or am I, am I, I comfortable here? Um, and I think a lot of that is, is I, obviously there are skills that, that are required there. Um, yeah. And, and the more I'm putting myself in those bad situations, the, the, the more comfortable I will be if it happens for real. Um, but I think a lot of it is just, recognizing and being able to understand that I, I'm going to be okay here, you know, yeah. and, and that yeah. emotion, not, not allowing my, my, my fear or my anger or whatever it is to, to be so overwhelming that I shut down. Cause everybody talks about fight or flight and those are good things. I mean, yeah. we're, we're hardwired to do those things, but, but freezing is, is the one that, that really gets us killed, you know, the free F yeah. Fight, flight or freeze. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, and I don't think if you're not touching hands with people and you're not getting punched in the face and you're not getting thrown on your head and you're not getting, um, put in, in a confined space and trying to do those kinds of things, yeah. it's going to be really difficult for you to know. Like I, oh, wow. I, I tell my students all the time, the first time you get punched in the face should not be between two cars in a parking lot when you and your, your kid are just trying to go home. Like that yeah. should be the first time you get rocked. Yeah. You know, it's just the same thing when you when we speak about mental and emotional preparation. Uh, for example, in, in you see the the, the way that we that we're taught is so you got the state management and the state access and state management would be like management of your emotional state, so managing your pain, fear, fatigue, uh, adrenaline, disorientation, confusion, denial, all the stuff that could actually come in there that you just need to go right snap snap out of that snap out of that. Uh, and then you have the state access, which is, you know, accessing the most resourceful state at the moment, which could be, you know, high level, enhanced level of observation, in-fight observation, or a uh, high level of aggression, cold clinical aggression on a switch that you could access like that. Uh, and all that stuff comes in, in hand in hand, I found, with breathing and and managing your, your heart rate, really. And so... That's also a very important thing. I think that, you know, that people should be taught is how to manage their heart rate, because as soon as the heart rate goes above 100, I think it's 100 beats per minute, 100, 110, 115 beats per minute, everything happens. All the physiological factors come into play, tunnel vision, auditory exclusion, time distortion, blood rushing away from the extremities to gather at the center mass, which is the most needed cognitive shift because the blood rush away from here 
prefrontal neocortex to limbic and you go limbic and now you're left with the intelligence of a dog pretty much and and, and that's where we're not not able to make any sound tactical decisions and all that and so how do you fight the fight when you are in that state how do you right. actually control that emotional response and that adrenal response it's 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 difficult man really difficult. it is and and you know i i we used to do um we, we've evolved a little bit since then, but we used to do um, like Jeff Thompson Animal Days. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Je Jeff Thompson was a, a, a pretty big influence of mine very oh, yeah, early. I'm um, interviewing him uh, Friday. Man, that's awesome. I, I, that, that, I, I um, a lot of kind of our, our beginnings were based on what, what Jeff was doing. Um, yeah. And uh, of his time, man. yeah, for sure. No, no doubt. Um, and, and, you know, I, I mean, and, and most of it is, has stood the test of time, you know, mo most of what Jeff was talking about decades ago is still very, very relevant today. Mm. So things like animal days and, and you know, that, that kind of a, a, a process once again, once we progress people properly, you know, I, 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 the analogy I give a lot of times is like, if I'm teaching somebody how to drive um, it, it's funny because I'm, I, I'm teaching my son how to drive a, a manual right now. Um, he's been driving a, a, an automatic car for four years, I guess. And I'm teaching him how to drive a manual now. And I'm teaching my daughter how to drive a car. Um, and so the analogy I give a lot of times is, look, if I'm going to teach you how to drive, we're probably going to start in a parking lot somewhere. And we're just going to drive around the parking lot. And we're going to work on parking, you know. If I spend 15 minutes with you in the parking lot and you're doing really, really well, I'm not all of a sudden going to be like, man, Jill, Julian, that's a really good job. Let's let's head out to the to the interstate. You know, let's go to the highway. Yeah. Surely there's something in between there. Right. We, mm -hmm. you, because, again, right now you just have. Knowledge, you don't have understanding. And and so one of the things that that's helped me. Um, a good friend of mine, he's a really good firearms instructor. His name is Daniel Shaw. Um, one, one thing that he said to me years ago, and it, it stuck with me, and I, 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 I give it to my students really pretty frequently, is what's my next problem to solve? And am I in the safest possible place? And, and those two things, if I, if I bring it back to, to, to those things, you know, and those things are going to constantly change in a, in a fluid, dynamic, violent situation. But if, if, if from a principle standpoint, I understand those things, what's my next problem to solve? Am I in the safest possible place? Then I can make decisions and problem solve in real time, you know, as opposed to what's my next technique, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. okay, what technique? here what technique do i need there because that's never gonna work man like you you talked about like the, like like 30 tactics and things like that eye gouges and stuff yeah. and i'm i'm all for all those things um but i think things like like uh i don't want to call them you know I, the 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 things like eye gouging and, and and biting and pulling hair and head buds yeah. and stuff like that. um I think those are, are, are for people that really understand how to fight. For Whereas sure. For sure. Most of the time, people in our industry present them as, well, if you don't know how to fight, do these things. Just do these things, yeah, without right. having like, a, a natural Kick them in the groin or whatever. Yeah. Like, dude, I, I, I remember the last time I got kicked in the groin. It just pissed me off. Like, it just made me really really mad and i wanted to throw the person through a window you know like yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it didn't it didn't have the effect. and i'm not saying don't do those things but if that's all you got yeah as soon as one of those things fails and 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 you know I, uh, pain is unreliable you don't know how somebody is going to react to pain absolutely man i've seen some freak of nature man dude i it can be somebody that just is is used to it you know they just been there before they don't give a fuck they could be high they could be drunk um yeah. just or be adrenalized somebody that's um, got a very high degree of pain compliancy yes and and you're you're on bottom and and you start reaching up trying to gouge that dude's eyes or whatever and now all of a sudden he recognizes hey you know what i could gouge your eyes too yeah, but yeah. I'm in a better position to do it than you are yeah, yeah. maybe i grab you by your hand and I bounce it off of the the the, the concrete yeah you know, so it, it, it's 
I, I think um, the, the technical side of things is greatly overemphasized in our, our industry because it's easy. Yeah. From a coaching standpoint, it's easy to just say, all right, if this, then that. He does A, you do B, he does C, you do D. And students like it. Yeah, yeah. Students like, well, just tell me what to do here. Students like that. They, they can leave there feeling, feeling good about themselves, feeling confident about the thing. And the reality is 999 times out of 1,000, they're never going to have to know the difference because they're never going to have to actually put it to real practice. Yeah. And all you gave was, you know, a collection of techniques and, you know, it fails for one reason or another. That that's going to be a really, really hard lesson to learn, assuming they survive. Mm, exactly, and that, that after what also what a lot of people forget is that it's like playing with people's lives, you know. Because as instructors, we are actually providing uh, an answer to violence, and you know, if what we sell is dreams, if we sell dreams to people, give them a false sense of security. The day when something happens to them, well, they're dead. And then you got you got death on your conscience, so, you, so people might not even give a fuck. But do you know what I mean? It's like right. I, 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 call li- I call what we do I call what we do life insurance. You know, life insurance. You, yeah. you, you have life insurance that you pay some company for, but that's really death insurance. You know, you you yeah. collect that when you're dead. <laughs> like yeah. that, that that's for your family or somebody else or whatever. What we do is is life insurance. You know, mm-hmm. I. And, and not just because I'm, I'm learning how to defend some guy that's trying to, to stab me in a parking lot. Just by virtue of me being in better shape, I'm more likely to live longer, you know? Yeah. And, 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 and that when I talk about being in shape, I don't mean just the physical, you know, I mean the mental, the, emotion, the emotional, the spiritual, whatever, kind of that holistic approach to, to, to life in general. Because the, the truth is, you, me, Anybody else, we're much more likely to die from heart disease, diabetes, obesity, stress, yeah. cancer than we are getting stabbed in a parking lot. You know, yeah. like, and, and so if, if people are coming to me to enhance their lives, part of that needs to be the whole, mm. not just, all right, well, what do I do if the guy chokes me like this? Well, okay, but how did you get here? Exactly. Where, did that dude, where did that dude come from? You know, what led up? He didn't fall out of the fucking sky and put his hand yeah. on you. Like, what, what led up to that? What decisions are you making that are that are putting you in these places? You know, yeah, there, there is a before, during, and after. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and so I think, I think as as instructors, we have a bit more responsibility than what a lot of us want to admit and take on. And and so it's a lot easier to just say. All right, we're going to work on two hand choke defense today. We're going to work on a headlock defense today. We're going to work on this thing today. Because as a coach, then I don't really have to think. As a student, you don't really have to think because you're just going to mimic whatever I'm telling you to do. And then as a coach, I have to hope you never have to use it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and, and, and honestly, I think most, most coaches, most instructors are very well intentioned. I, I don't think they, they, they have any malice behind the way they're teaching or why they're teaching things the way they do. Um, they're doing what somebody else told them to do, you know, that they believed in. Um, and I mean, look, I think most of us have been there before, mm. you know, but the, the vast majority of people um, that have come to some sort of realization like, like you have and I have and other, other people have, we didn't start here. Oh, yeah, yeah. There was you a know, it, up to it. it was a journey. Oh, yeah. And, and so I, I, you know, and I, I think I'm still on that journey. I mean, I, we're, we're hosting a, 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 a grappling camp this weekend where I'm, I'm bringing in six different instructors. We're doing two, three hour sessions a day, one gi, one no gi. Um, we got judo, wrestling, jujitsu, like, and, and I'll be in all of those sessions. You know, I have a black belt in jujitsu. I've been wrestling for, for, for a long time. Um, I, I'm always open to new ways of doing things and better ways of doing things, better ways of, as a coach of, of disseminating that information. Yeah, I, I hear that, man. 
So when it comes to styles also, that, that's one thing I wanted to speak about. You see, obviously, like I said, when you get when you gain combative maturity, you start thinking a different way. And uh, I, there's a lot of people that go, oh, this style is better than that style. And, you know, this style is superior than that style. And, and I tend to think that, you know, there is it's about finding the right middle, finding the equilibrium between these two ways of thinking, because there is such a thing as the individual yeah. and how, how, you know, how dedicated the individual is to his craft. How many times does a person train every week or how many hours a day? Um, that will make a massive difference. I mean, I know some guys that are training some less combative form of martial arts, but they're fucking difficult to deal with. Because they, they because the, they're in it so much and they're fit and they 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 got their balance and they got I know some Tai Chi guys that are you know pretty difficult to put on the ground. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And so, I, mean, I I worked the door with some guys that had never trained a day in their lives. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Like then you got monsters mindset. You got then you get. I, 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 it's the same thing. I worked the doors with. I'll tell you what. I worked the doors with one guy. Uh, I mean, I worked the doors with quite a lot of different people. But well, one guy is a Bengali guy. He's not tall. He's quite. He's quite short. He's. Uh, I mean, I'm quite. I'm quite tall. I'm six foot one. Yeah. But he's. He's. Uh, probably up to here. Do you know what I mean? He's. He's quite short. But he's quite. He's quite big. Uh, he yeah. doesn't train anything except he goes to the gym and lifts weights and does deadlift. That's all. That's all he does. But he's got the mindset. And very often we're we're referred to as the good cop, bad cop. Me and him. Because I'm the guy that's smiley. I'm the guy that gets along with customers. I joke with customers. I, I develop a relationship uh, yeah. with, with, with the, the door lads and the customers because that's just the way I am. I like to work like that. And people like me for it. You know, I've got more respect for it. I don't yeah. have to use force most of the time. I just have to talk and resonate with people. And it works. It works for me. It doesn't mean that I can't, you know, that I don't have to turn it up every now and then. Sure. But... Um, that dude I'm talking about, uh, Hassan, he just switch. He's got that mindset where he's like, his eyes start, his eyes are starting to go like that, and he's like, "Fuck it, I'm going." And he just switches, yeah. and he just gets like three, four people out in in like a couple of minutes. Yeah. They're all out. You're like, "Fuck you know? <laughs> you know? So yeah, you you get you get people like that. They just have that mindset. They just have that right. combative mindset where they're like, "Fuck it." When they switch it on, that's it. They're in business. Yeah. Very nice people, though. But so, but going back to styles versus people. Right. Now, if we look at styles, it's true that to me, anyway, I, I respect every styles, okay, because I think every style has got something to offer. But I would be lying if I said that I, I didn't think that some styles had more to offer regarding efficiency than than others. And uh, as I said to you before, you know, when it comes to standing. Uh, uh, striking, I said Thai boxing, Muay Thai is probably to me the most uh, superior standing uh, form agree. of combat, you know. Yeah, and, and then you go in, in terms of uh, in terms of wrestling, this is more open because there's some really there's more than one really good uh, wrestling background. I mean, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Russian Sambo. Uh, you got even you know even Africans have got their own type of yep. uh, of wrestling you know and it's, you got Senegalese wrestling you got you got yep. all sorts of things out there and there's some good stuff to take Mongolian yeah mm -hmm. Mongolian yeah say, say like Mongolian wrestling Mongolian wrestling yeah absolutely I mean, it, man. yeah it, and and I, I tell you yeah. I, one one of my my least favorite questions that I get and I get this through email and social media a lot is Hey, I live in so and so. What's the best style for self defense? Yeah, I was thinking about that when it was this. Well, you know, because it, it it's rarely again. If 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 they came to me and they said my choices are Taekwondo and Muay Thai, yeah, okay, I, I would send them to Muay Thai. Yeah. Um, but it, it, if it's if it's more than that, if it's broader than that, then it's really about the coach and business from the coach because really like I, you 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 mentioned your karate background um i worked years ago with with a, a french guy that was one of the toughest fucking dudes i'd ever met in my life and he, he had a the a, a kayakoshan 
karate background. Mm -hmm. Um, he was one of the scariest dudes I've ever been around ever in just, just period tough as hell. Like, but he, that, you know, he was brought up and trained. It, it wasn't necessarily, I mean, th this style definitely played a role, but it was much more the emphasis that, that his instructors had put on the style, the way that they were going to train. Yeah. You know, I, I could say, well, jujitsu is great, but if I send you to, um, and, and this is no knock against like 10th planet jujitsu, um, I think they've revolutionized uh, the way jujitsu um, it, it is in competitions. Um, but a whole lot of what they do, I, you know, and, and, and they wouldn't either, it wouldn't be recommended for self-defense, you know? Yeah. And so I can't just say, well, find a good jujitsu school. Well, what does that mean? What's a good jujitsu school? You know, good for what? Um, and, and so I, I think it's a hard question to answer um, because I, like you're saying, it's it's styles matter, but they don't matter nearly as much as as what the industry wants us to believe. Um, yeah. It's much more about the individual and, and the coach. Um, the approach. I think, instructor. Yeah. yeah, the approach. What's what's the goal? What what are we trying to do? Yeah. You know, is the goal to win um, a gold medal at an IBJJF tournament? Okay, mm -hmm. I know where to send you for that. Is the goal to get from the parking garage to your office? Okay, then we may have to look a little a little deeper for that. You know, yeah. because I don't want you pulling guard. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's the same, like, um, when I went to, I went to live in Scotland. So I, at, at that point I was getting married, I was in uh, Ukraine and, um, I actually went, uh, I, I, w I was supposed to go to France for a bit, but I thought, fuck it, I'm going to go to, uh, Glasgow so I can learn because I wanted to learn Bruce Lee's, Bruce Lee's martial arts from, yeah. uh, Tommy Carruthers, uh, that I've been watching for years and years and years and years as I was growing up and his mentality that's what I liked about it, but you can see it's reflected in the way that he moves because when you go and train in there, it's a very, very tough mindset mentality. It's like, you know, when we do the drills, we work the drills and it's always very, very tough and strict. And when we actually pressure test, it's like, right, I want you to try and knock each other out. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. whoa, you know, it's, and you got that mindset of, I mean, I should, I should, maybe I shouldn't say that, but, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you like a little bit at some point. We were doing some pressure testing and one guy got punched in the nose and got his nose broken. And so he was pissed. He was yep. pissing blood. Yep. And, and Tommy just looked at the guy that punched him like, like he was going to say something. And he went like, he went like, <laughs> he went and fucking started laughing, bro. And I was like, fuck you now, mate. <laughs> but, so yeah, yeah, you know, it, it, it was just, it was just the type of mentality. And, and I'm not right. saying that that's the right thing, but let's just say that if you want to learn to fight for the street, I'd rather learn from some, I mean, that's just me. That's just me. Right. Not everyone right. is like, well, I, I'd rather learn from somebody like Tommy or Lee that have got that sort of mindset of, you know, fuck him up before he does yeah. it to you. Right. Uh, because it, it puts you, it, 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 yeah, it, it leaves a certain imprint on your mindset when it comes to fighting. And like you said, this is not who I am every day. I'm actually a very nice person, very spiritual guy. I like to be happy. I like to smile. I like to joke. I like to be happy and make people happy. You can't make everyone happy, but, you know, no. I'm that sort of person. But I know who I'm ready to. I know who I can become when I need it. When I when I switch it on, I know I can go from light to darkness in a fraction of a second. And, I'll you know, I'll rip somebody's head off. I know it. I've, I've visualized right. it enough. But... So the mindset of the, the teacher is very, very important. That's why I've always been very, very selective who I'm going to train with. But I look at some, and generally because I'm a very visual, kinesthetic learner, when I look at instructors, I look the way they, the way they move and the way mm -hmm. they talk, and I know straight away whether I want to go and train with them or not. Do you know what yep. I mean? Yep, yep. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that makes it hard for beginners because – they can't do that. Mm. They, they, they don't. And, and, and in the social media world, it's very easy to get sucked in by somebody that's dynamic and engaging and they're doing a lot of cool shit on Instagram 
And if you don't know any different, you know, I, it, it's very easy to, to get sucked into that kind of, of, of thing. That's why, like, again, if we go back to the styles thing, I can't just say, well, go find a good karma guy place, go find a good yeah. jujitsu place, go find judo. What I, I don't know. Um, because I know a lot of guys that, man, they, they can own a room, you know, they can be super dynamic, super engaging. Um, you can buy into what they're telling you like this, but then when you really look at what they're teaching, it's like, mm, shit. like I've, I, I know some guys and I'm not going to, I'm not going to name names, but I know some that have written some books that are, I, I think are great. Like really good information. I, you know, I've read the I've read, I'm reading it and I'm like, man, this dude really gets it. This guy really understands it. And then I, and then I see, see him teach. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> you know, like there's this disconnect. Um, but it, it, if you haven't been in this for a while, you can't make that determination. It's and true. I, it's I true. get why it, it's a it's a hard um, it's a hard kind of industry for people to figure out, you know, because uh, you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Do you know, I, I still remember the time when I was young, younger, and, and I used to love all the flying, spinning kicks. And, you know, that's what we're seeing in the movies. And I was like, I want to fight like Jet Li. I want to yeah. fight like, I want to learn how to fight like Jackie Chan or like Jet Li or like, and, and you know, and, and then you start stepping on the ring and have a few fights and you're like, right, I'm going to stop with all that flying, <laughs> spinning shit. You know, I'm just going to. I just moved out of the move. way. I don't know what happened. He just moved. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. know. I, I love that. Do you know the the fights when the guy does a spinning kick and the guy moves out and he's like, "Yeah, <laughs> like he's gone. He's, your, your your kick is gone." Yeah. So um, I'll tell you what, because the good thing is that until now we kind of free flowed with our interview. We did any. I mean, we touched on some of the questions that I had, right. uh, which is good. And um, I, I was gonna say, so I was gonna ask you. What is your martial art background? I got a good idea because I see what you do. And then, you know, I know right. enough about martial arts to, to know that you're into grappling and striking, which is good, some type of MMA. Uh, but did you want to tell us about it? And also, how did you gravitate towards combatives and what made you gravitate towards combatives? Yeah. Um, so like like a lot of people, I started in traditional martial arts. Um, I was doing karate and, and, and shorenji kempo. Um, so... Um, I, I, as a kid, I've always been small. Like I'm bigger now than I've ever been in my life. I've always been smaller. I've always been, you know, um, the, most of my life I've been five, seven, 130, 135 pounds. Um, and, and so at a young age, I had to, I, I learned pretty quickly that I needed to learn how to, how to talk, how to fight and how to run. <laughs> and I, 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 I I mostly got pretty good at all, all three, some better than others. Um, and then, so I was in my fair share of, of, of things growing up and, uh, I didn't start martial arts until a little later in life. Cause I just didn't have the opportunity to do so. Um, and so at some point I was like, you know, what I'm doing doesn't look like any of the fights I've ever been in or ever seen. Like I, I just, I, I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun with it, but um, and I think a lot of it was I had this attachment to as a kid, I always wanted to learn to look like Bruce Lee or, or Jet Lee or Tony John or, or whatever. And, you know, I, I grew up on Kung Fu theater and, and all that stuff. Um, and so I had this I had this idea of what I wanted. And then I got to a realization that, OK, but this is cool. I'm having fun, but it's not like any fight I've ever been in. Yeah. And, um, so that led me to, to looking for other things. And, and, and while I was doing that, I was, I was doing some jujitsu. Um, I was doing some, uh, Balenta walk Arnis, um, which, you know, I, I, here, here again is, is where I think coaching matters. I was working with, um, grandmaster Bobby Tawada, who the dude can fight like good boxer, like tremendous hands. Um, and, and so, and he was very honest about his approach. You know, he, he would say, look, in a real fight or a real stick fight, it's just whack, whack, you know, like it's just wow. So I, I learned a lot from him about how to, how to teach. Um, 
And my eye hand speed, eye hand coordination was never better than when I was doing that stuff. Um, but I, I, I just knew that what I was doing didn't look like the fights I was in. So that that led me to looking at more at at, at Muay Thai, at Krav Maga. Um, I started doing more wrestling. Um, work with with a guy that was was heavy into sambo. Um, mm -hmm. Did uh, a lot of traveling because um, it just wasn't a lot where I was. Um, so I went to Thailand, I went all over the U S you know, uh, anywhere that there was, um, a seminar with somebody that I thought, like I spent a lot of time with boss Rutten very early on. Oh, yeah, yeah. I went, I went and trained with boss. I brought boss here. Funny. He's um, a funny guy. Funny, as well, isn't it, boss? He dude. Um, and, and just tough as shit. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he, and you talk about a guy that can flip a switch. Yeah. I've that, seen these fights. That dude. He's um and, and so, also, can fight without gloves that's what i like is used to fight without the gloves yeah yep yeah. and so i spent a lot of time with uh, with boz um early on um guys like eric paulson um yeah. where where it was kind of this early mma you know um shooto pancreas the, yeah. the, these kinds of of influences um, and then that, that really drove me, not just from a, from a, a technical standpoint, but from a, a, a methodology standpoint, how to train, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so our training is, is much more akin to kind of MMA, I would, I would say, um, with a, a, a contextual understanding for self-defense. Um, and, and so that led me to, you know, all the things that, that you would normally gravitate to from there where you're, you're getting more into jiu-jitsu and judo and, and and those kinds of things. And like I said, I mean, I spent, uh, I don't know, probably close to 10 years uh, with Krav Maga. Um, but I was still doing other things um, while I was doing that. Um, and, and that was a, you know, again, that was another process for me. Um, at, at the time, I hadn't seen anybody delivering adult self-defense in a way that they were. Um, and, and so I, I learned a lot uh, from Krav Maga. I learned a lot about how not to do things as well, mostly from a, from a, a teaching standpoint. Um, but I, I, I had some amazing instructors, you know, that taught me a lot um, on the mindset side as well. You know, okay. some really tough dudes that been there, done that kind of thing. Um, and, and so there, I, people ask me, uh, you know, well, do you regret this, that, the other? I don't regret any of it. You know, I, I don't, um, I'm, I, I think all of that was necessary to get me to where I am now. You know, I, needed, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, I needed to go through all of that to have a really good understanding of what, what I think, at least today, what I think works and doesn't work and why it works and why it doesn't work. And, you know, why it still might sometimes work, you know, yeah. like, so, I, you know, I, I think my, my, my background is similar to a lot of people that, that have kind of found themselves in this place in our industry. Um, I don't have uh, a military background or law enforcement background or anything like that. Um, I, I've, I've trained a lot of those guys, um, but I'm very open and honest, like from, from jump, I get in front of a, a, a group of, of police officers or military unit or whatever. I'm like, look, Everybody in here knows how to do your job better than I do. I'm not here to tell you how to do your job better. I'm here to offer a very specific set of, of, of skills and ideas mm -hmm. that hopefully will help enhance your jobs. Um, yeah. and, and I think it's important that, you know, instructors are, are open and honest about that. I don't show up in, in, in BDUs and, and looking like I, I, I'm a police officer or anything like that. You know, I, 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 I wear what I would wear otherwise, unless, unless it, it, it's necessary for the course. You know, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm teaching um, handgun retention in a duty belt or something like that, then yes, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to look the part because it's necessary. But outside of that, I'm not trying to look like something I'm not. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You know, that, that's really reflect um, that, that reflects humbleness, you know, and I, I think that that's a big thing in our job, in our line of work. It's trying to be as humble as possible. That that is an attractive trait to uh, to to people in general, especially when you go and teach, uh, like professional. I mean, I I was lucky enough, I was fortunate enough to assist my father because my father was an instructor as well in in the French Special Forces, and uh, 
when he was posted in Eastern Europe. So at the Riga, Latvia, Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, Moscow, Kiev, all, all these places. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fortunate enough to actually assist him uh, providing training for, for the military, for prison guards, for police forces, for all, all sorts of really serious people. And I mean, the Lithuanians and the Russians are some of the scariest people. You, you know, they're very, very nice people. Don't get me wrong. But right. when it comes to fighting, Right. These guys are fucking monsters, man. Do you know what I mean? Like the especially the Russians, like the yeah, the mindset. And not only the mindset, they're they're big, they're strong. They're, they're, yes. They're, yeah. they're, they're they are in shape. Yeah. They're, they're they're physically in shape, they're mentally in shape, they're emotionally in shape. They're yeah. they're they are hardened folks. Yeah. And so imagine, you know, me at age 15, uh, you know, just going through the training with the, with the special intervention group of the 2nd Regiment of Internal Forces of Lithuania and so all these guys in khaki and and we end up at the shooting range as well. And I mean, all that, that was all an education, man. And I grew up, I was really lucky. I consider myself lucky to, to have been able to do that with my father. Yeah. But when you when you get in front of these people, you get, in, you get quite intimidated, you know, yeah. you're like, fuck. What am I gonna? You know, they, they look at you arriving, and I'm just that 15 year old little little guy, you know, yep. and and these guys are fucking massive. So yeah, no, I've learned a lot of stuff, and uh, and on the mental, on the mental aspect as well, you know, yep. it's they, these guys have got a lot to give. I think that you know, Eastern Europeans and and Slavics in general are very uh, misunderstood people, yep. but once you get to know them, they're very very nice people, you know, very very um, welcoming. Well. Once you get to know them, once they get to know you, bro. You know? Yeah, my, my, my only real exposure um, for, for any long period of time, I taught a course in French Guyana a few years ago uh, to the, the, the Legion. Legioners. Um, well yeah. yeah. And um, a, a, probably two thirds of, of the unit I was working with was made up of, of Eastern European guys. Polish, um, Lithuanians, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, very, very fucking tough dudes. They, 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 I, I had to spend no time on, you know, uh, emotional toughness and, and readiness and things like that. Like, I, I, they, they should have been teaching that part of things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like these, these guys are over there for to do their um, jungle survival uh, training in French yeah. Guiana. That's where they, that's where they do their uh, their training, the jungle training. Yeah, yeah, my father, tough, my father was there it's for a tough environment. You know, tough. everything, everything in the jungle is trying to kill you. So, father, you know, there is one, one, uh, one guy uh, that my one of my father's instructor when he was in the Legion was saying, uh, in this place you can either find hell or paradise. It, it, it depends of your mentality. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's true. Every single insect is like, oh, fuck, you got to know when you get there. The first thing they teach you is how to recognize, how to spot and recognize all the different type of insects. Hey, I had I had a couple of guys that were supposed to be in my course that couldn't be in it because they had contracted some kind of flesh eating bacteria. Fuck. Yep. So <laughs> they, they, that's a different world, man. And I mean, yeah. they, they, these guys were, you know, they they had two primary missions one they were, were they were protecting some sort of um space installation that that uh france uh and shares with a couple of different countries so they protect yeah. that and then they also uh go and infiltrate these these illegal mining camps so mm -hmm. you you have people it's 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 almost like drug running um you have these guys that go up and set up these illegal mines um for gold and they, you know, they, they literally put, put it in backpacks on people and they, they, they go through the jungle, but the way that they, the way that they extract everything in, in the mining process process is, is really detrimental to the environment, um, because it's illegal, you know, they're not, they're not doing anything the right way They're because they're, they're trying to be low key and, and, but I mean, these, it's a dangerous job because these guys are, you know, if they get caught, they're fucked, you know. So, you know, all the time, right? so it's uh, it was a that was an interesting time for me. And I, le I learned a lot. Um, no, but I, I try to do that, you know, wherever I go. I mean, I taught a special forces group in, at Ramstein in, in Germany one time, and um, this is a really small group, but I learned a lot, you know. I, 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 I try to take in as much as I can when I go places because those dudes have very different experiences for me, not, not just professionally, but culturally, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I try to um, absorb as much of that as possible. Yeah. I bet, you know, it's, it's, 
that's one thing, you know, when you realize that even as an instructor, you're always learning and you learn from your students. And that's the thing. A lot of people are, no, no. But you learn more from your student than you learn from other from other people. You learn how to teach by looking at your students and how they how they process the information. I, I tell people all the time, look, if, if, if you think you really you really understand a thing, then then try to teach it. Yeah. That'll tell you real fast if you actually understand it or if you're just uh, mimicking something that you've been told. Um, and you'll learn really quickly. OK, maybe I didn't understand it quite as well as I thought I did, because this guy's asking me a question that I can't really answer, mm. you know, yeah. um, or I can't really figure out. I know they're not doing something quite right, but I can't really figure out what it is, you know. Um, and so I, I've learned way more from from since I started teaching um yeah. than, than probably i ever did prior to uh, that, that that's that's one thing that lee uh lee, lee morrison always always said to me you know the if you if you want to learn you got to start to teach that's when you truly start learning because now you ask yourself the questions and now you're and also do you know as uh as an instructor if somebody asks you a question and you're like you don't have the answer now it makes you think now you're like do you know what i'll give you my email address uh, you know, give me oh, give me your right. your your email, and I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, because yep. then you have to go and do your research, and it, it, you know, every time you get more knowledge, you get more knowledge, you get more knowledge. Uh, yeah, no, and, and you know, from on the practitioner side, um, I, I think that's a good test too. You know, if if, yeah. if you ask somebody a question and they dismiss your question or they they bullshit an answer that tells you a lot about that instructor that coach i i i I would much have much more respect for the guy that's like uh you know what i'm i'm not totally sure um Mm -hmm. i can tell you kind of what i think but um give give me give me some time and let me get back let me ask some guys that i i really trust and believe and 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 i i'll get back to you i would much rather hear that than a dude that's like one that's like oh that never happens or you know it's like giving me some bullshit answer it's honesty you know it it shows it shows shows the level of honesty that that you have man yeah so let if we move on to a, a subject that is really really complicated subject in our line of work which is i don't like to call it knife defense because if you try to defend a knife you're dying yeah, yeah. but uh the way that we call it in combatives is counter weapon tactics, counter blade tactics. And yeah. so against there are different types of knife threats, obviously. A lot of people in the martial arts, in the self-protection industry, they teach you how to deal with somebody that already got the blade out and is coming at you and you and you've seen it and right. which is not realistic at all. I mean, nine times out of ten, you don't see the blade until you felt until you felt it. Yeah. And um, and you know. They start from the last. They start from the very, very last thing that, that you train, when right. the, the really first thing, because there is always a beginning, middle, and end, uh, should be working on your pre-threat cue recognition, learning mm-hmm. how to spot the guy before he's actually about to access his weapon, and how do you deal with the weapon uh, before it's out? Right. Uh, how do you deal with uh, the weapon when it's already out and in play, which is the last thing? Yep. Or how do you deal with a with a bladed hold up? In, in which case, you know, if you didn't, if the guy had the chance and the opportunity to put the blade on you, yeah, he you could have stabbed you many times. That means yeah. that your your situational awareness and and you know behavioral awareness was not on point. Right. Maybe you're inside a, a club and it's really really loud music. There is smoke and lights everywhere. You're just at the bar. You just got two drinks and you turn around and you got you got yep. somebody grabbing you and you got a blade on you or so how do you how do you deal with how do you deal with this and what is the best strategy and tactics would you say in order yeah. to deal with the with a blade at the cell and somebody that yeah. has got a blade? So we we come at it from the perspective of of, of one learn to learn how to fight, you know, and, and and I because I think a lot of systems, a lot of styles, it's like all right, it all your empty end stuff looks like this. And now there's a there's a there's a knife out, so we're gonna do something completely fucking different. Well, and unless unless they're gonna devote an inordinate amount of time to now learning a completely new delivery system, yeah, um, that I don't think that's a realistic approach. And and so 
if you can't fight another human being that is unarmed, there's no amount of, of super cool knife defense techniques that you can learn that's going to now allow you to fight that same human being that has a knife. Like that, that, that defies logic. So we, we come at it from the standpoint of learn how to fight. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, within that is some of the things we've talked about already, you know, uh, being able to, to recognize some, some pre-contact cues, understanding that the hands are what kills. You know, you, you need to know where that dude's hands are, what that dude's hands are doing, where his weight is, those kinds of things. Um, we do a ton of clinch work uh, because I, I, I believe that that fights, once the fight is on, fights are won and lost in the clinch. Um, if it's going to go to the ground, it should go to the ground on my terms. If my clinch game sucks, that's not the case. It will go to the ground on his terms. Yeah. Um, if I have a good clinch game, I can know where that guy's hands are without having to see them. Yeah, like, um, I, uh, oh, uh, how do you call that? Tactile awareness. I've got that tactile sensitivity mm. to know because I, I may not even be able to see. It, it may be dark, you know, if, if, if I get woken up in my house or if we go back to your club scenario, I may not be able to see all that well. Um, but once I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing that dude, I need to be able to feel like when I roll, um, like grappling jiu jitsu, um, now you have to have good training partners for this, but I, 80% of the time I roll with my eyes closed yeah, um, okay. because I, I, I want to be able to rely on not just having to see a thing because I, yeah. I, I think once you, especially when the fight's on, if it requires you to see it, it's too late. It's already happening. Yeah. You know, I want to feel that dude's hands as soon as he goes from push to pull, as soon as he goes from high to low. Um, and, and, and if it's, if it's, we're clinched and that guy I see his hand go to his waistband. Yeah. I'm already behind. I'm yeah. already losing. And and so um obviously all the pre-contact stuff and you know preemption if 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 I need to hit the dude first, I should hit the dude first um or get my hands on him, you know, uh clinch him, grab him. Um and and so like we do a two-day we call it edge of reality uh knife course. Um I mean, we do shorter versions too, but the, the, the one, if I have the opportunity, we do two day. Um, and the, the whole first day we don't touch a knife. Like there, there, there's no knives involved at all. Um, we, we talk about how in a, in a, a lot of cases, the, the, the non knife hand leads, you know, the attack, the dude grabs or punches yeah, or punches or something, and then the knife comes behind that. Um, whereas like you said earlier, the vast majority in our industry, it's okay, here's the knife. They're going to stab like this, or here's the knife. It's going to come like this, or here's the knife. It's going to come like this, but that's not what happens. Um, can it happen that way? Sure. Of course it can, but we know that the other hand tends to lead. Yeah. So if we're not ever training that, what are we really doing our, our students a, a good service? And so we, we, the, the whole first day it's let, let's, let's have a good understanding of, of, what to look for, um, how to feel, you know, we do a ton of, of mostly wrestling drills. Yeah. Um, sensitivity drills. Yes. Uh, but literally from basic wrestling, um, uh, and, and Muay Thai. I mean, there's some inside biceps control and clinch work and you know, that, those kinds of things. Um, not a lot of, of, of like double neckties because uh, for me, that should be a, a transition that I grab because that's what was a, immediately there, but I can't hang out yeah, there. No, you have to get on the inside up, first. You know, like, yeah, yeah, control his good. arms and yeah. yeah. Um, so, and then using that, I, we, we, we try to get people to understand that, that your, your wrestling and your striking should not be separate they should not be mutually exclusive you know i use my wrestling to set up my striking my striking to set up my wrestling um yeah. and and in that way um i've got a bit more holistic approach to fighting and the other guy doesn't have to worry about just my wrestling or just my striking you know yeah. um so if i've got a, a two-on-one for example i'm headbutting them and i'm kneeing them and i'm throwing little short uppercuts and maybe i'm i'm, I'm cracking down on that elbow and things like that um as opposed to okay i'm just gonna wrestle this guy or i'm just yeah, gonna yeah. try to I'm, I'm gonna try to box this dude that is boxing me back but he has a blade <laughs> you know yeah, yeah, yeah. um so 
Um, I, I do think that in our industry, I, knife work is kind of the, the, the boogeyman of the industry. You know, it's the thing that people are always chasing for the answer. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think the answer is learn how to fight, you know, and, yeah. and, and understand that it's still going to suck. Oh, yeah. If the other guy is committed and he's aggressive and mm. he really wants to put that knife through you, he's probably going to be more successful than not. You yeah. know, if, yeah. if I failed on on the, the preemption, the pre-contact phase of things, um, I'm probably going to get touched up. It's almost you know? too late, isn't it? That, that's, that's the thinking is that, oh, shit, I was, I was going to say something. And go, Have you got a dog in the background? Oh yeah, oh, I heard the dog there, crying. There, there are four of them here. All oh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, when 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 it comes to the the knife stuff, basically, is shit. Do you know what? I got a hole. That's not good. This doesn't happen to me very often, but it's just, <laughs> I thought of it something. Happens to me all the time. Just let. Uh, I, I'll I'll just let you continue, bro. <laughs> no, it happens we'll to me all the time. We'll come back. We'll come back. Hey, hey, wait! You're you're young. Wait till you're my age. It's gonna have a lot more. I got bad news well, for you. It's got hit in the head too many times. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, I get that's it. That's what it is, man. No, it's it's. I I think everybody wants the secret sauce when it comes to knife work, yeah. um, because that's what their students want. Their student, your students don't want to be told, man, you could do everything right and still get killed. Yes. You know, oh, I remember what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. All right, go ahead. <laughs> the, 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 the thing is that the simple way that we that I started to train to show people uh, that a lot of the stuff that they teach, it just doesn't work. Yeah. It's just take a small plastic bottle, empty it of its content and just come at me. Just oh, go I'm just gonna go, oh, I'm just going to go for you. I mean, before that, what we do is for maybe like two, two minutes, we're just going to tag each other in the head with a plastic bottle a bit everywhere right. to get used to how it feels like to actually get, get, you know, get punched with that bottle. Yeah. And then we just go for, go for each other and see what, see what works and see what doesn't. And you find out you get stabbed a lot. You get tagged a lot. You get cut a lot. You get, and, and then there is, you know, the old school method, which is um, white t-shirts with uh, right. red markers, stuff that we used to do with my old yep. man when we were younger. And the funny one, the Italian way, you know, the twig stick rubbed in dog shit. <laughs> yeah, it's all, all, all sorts of stuff in there. But when you start oh, yeah. with pressure, it's like, shit, most of that stuff doesn't work. And you got to be lucky to gain that two on one. Like, you got to be lucky to actually catch that arm, first of all, you know, yeah. without, without getting killed. And then from there, yes, from there, once you got that arm, then you got, you got a lot of things that you can do. Well, how do you... and, and, and yeah, and, and that thing, like it, because I, I see people and, and sometimes I think they're just trying to mimic something that they maybe saw in a video or, or, or yeah. whatever. Like I wouldn't teach, I wouldn't try to teach somebody to catch a punch, you know, like I, no I, chance. I, no yeah. chance. Um, so why do you think you'll, you'll, you'll catch somebody trying to stab you? If you don't have an understanding of, of of how to move and how to how to how to strike to get to better position and, and angle and get behind elbow and these kinds of things. Yeah. You're never just going to catch that arm. I, I use the analogy of the fly, you know, to a little fly that goes. It's fucking flying really fast. Is the guy trying to cut? Especially if the guy is like me, for example. I've been training with knives for a long time, yeah. and I'd I'd challenge anyone to fucking stop me without without getting cut or stabbed. Yeah. And it's like, try and catch a little fly like this flying at full speed. You, you're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to be able to see. No. It's like really maybe getting the arm at the level of the shoulder and, and higher than the elbow where now that's not moving as fast. And now you can maybe get a better control from there. But still doing it without getting stabbed and without getting caught is near impossible. Like, Yeah. Yeah. And I... I, when when it comes to that, I'm kind of with the mindset. I'm not one of these guys that it's like you will get stabbed. Yeah. You know, but I'm also like you probably will get stabbed. And he, yeah. you know, like, you probably will get touched up. Um, but I, I I don't I don't follow the you absolutely will because I just don't think there are absolutes in fighting. Like I, I I've seen dudes I've seen dudes you know because I I would never say well you will get punched. Well shit I don't know I. I I was in a fight one time. A dude threw one one big overhand like haymaker punch, 
I rolled underneath it, double legged him. That was it. It was over. I never got touched up. Nothing, you know, um, things happen. And I don't, I don't want, I don't want people to think, well, Ryan said I will get stabbed, so I should expect it. And it's okay. Like, no, no. fuck that. Like, it's- yeah, it's, it's already some type of mental and emotional preparation where now you're like, right. It, it, it's like, uh, I know I, I uh, paraphrase Lee a lot because I've learned a lot of stuff from him. Yeah, no, it's good. Uh, and when he goes, right, you can either say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to survive. Well, now, if you, if, you, if you do whatever it takes and you survive, well, it's cool. You survived, but maybe you got stabbed. Maybe you're completely fucked up. Maybe you need to go to the hospital. Maybe you'll never be able to walk again. Right. Do you know what I mean? But if you say to yourself, I'm going to do whatever it takes to prevail, to completely win and completely like overtake and completely eclipse the, the, the threat, then now if you're successful, then you go home without a scratch. And the worst case scenario is you will survive. But... The thing is, if you tell yourself, I'm going to do it, it's a bit like NLP, you know, it's yep. really using neuro linguistic programming, how you speak to yourself, of how do you see the situation and the outcome of the situation? Like, is the best, the best case scenario is you surviving? No, no. The best case scenario is you going home without a single scratch. Yeah, that, that, that is. And so, yes, I think it's very important to to how you communicate to yourself is very important because, like right. you say, if you say to yourself, I'm going to get stabbed, then you're not even going to try not to get – I mean, you will try, but in somewhere in your mind, you're not going to try not to get stabbed. Right. So, somewhere you've decided it's okay. Yeah. And it's that not. is – I don't think it's not, not. Yeah, not okay because it just takes one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It's true. It's true. I, but it's true. I – I, I do think like and 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 there's some really good people doing doing good nice stuff out there, um, but I think the mistake that a lot of people make is you know just looking for the answer and I I just don't you there's know it, no, there's no answer uh, it, it, it's it, it's it's a problem that that's not going to be solved with just you know this thing or that thing yeah um, somebody that's really committed is going to be a, a a significant problem. Do you, do you know one one thing that I kind of something that I came to that I came to a conclusion that I came to when it comes to all that stuff is that the knife is not the weapon. The knife the knife on its own on the, on the table will not hurt anyone. It takes the intention to cause deadly harm to actually yeah. pick up that knife and put it into somebody else. And right. you you know people that speak about knife these arms, I'm like oh fuck. I'm like you know it's like okay if you speak about knife disarm then you don't understand anything because once you take his knife now you have reversed the predatory prayer role now the guy is going to fight even harder because now his life is in danger do you yeah. know what i mean but yeah. and, so, and, and, and my thing with disarms is it's like because you, you'll, you'll see people do disarms and i'm like okay but what, what do you think that guy's doing while you're trying to to, to take this knife from him. He's going to hit you with everything else that he's got. And he's going to do it. It, just, it defies logic. It, yeah. I tell I tell people all the time, look, fuck that knife. What, consciousness. The, 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 the guy is your problem. Take you know? his consciousness. Um, and yeah. and if, I, if, if that knife comes out of his hand, it's because I've, I've done something to make him drop it. Yeah. You know? Um, whether that's blunt force trauma or me taking him down or, or whatever it is, but I'm not, I'm not, if I'm, if I'm physically trying to take the knife from the guy, that means that guy's still fighting. And, and I've taken my attention off of this, this human that is trying to fight me to try to, you know, like try to take something from a six year old that doesn't want to give it to you. Yeah, like, as difficult it, as it is. It's not easy to do, yeah. you know? Um, and, and so I, I think we make a huge mistake by hyper fixating, but 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 being weapon centric. I get it. I understand why it happens, yeah. um, but I think it 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 sets us up for a, a real problem when all of a sudden that guy is fighting back. And, yeah. and you know, and I think it's a training flaw in a lot of cases because in training centers, people allow you to do your 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 fancy your your fancy disarm. But if you give that guy a boxing glove on the other hand that's going to change things. Exactly. And that, that's what, that's what I said, you know, consciousness. Now, if you, if you pull the plug, you know, if, if you take somebody's consciousness, now all of a sudden, nothing else works. Right. The knife doesn't work. The legs don't work. The, the, the brain don't work. Nothing works. So it's, it's really, that is the real weapon is yeah. the person's consciousness and not even only consciousness, but like I said, is the intention 
Yeah. You need to take that intention away from him, either, like you said, by full blunt force trauma or creating enough damage, even on a, on a psychological level or emotional level, physical level, or completely incapacitate him to completely dissuade his attitude. That's people start fighting. People start fighting because I take their heart or I take their consciousness. Yeah, that's it. You know, yeah. taking somebody's heart is not easy to do. You don't know what what that is going to take. I know what it's going to take to take somebody's consciousness. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. but I don't know what it's going to take to take somebody's heart. You don't know who you got in front of you. I Some I don't know. I don't know anything about this dude in front of me. I know that he's willing to take a piece of steel and try to run it through me. That tells me a lot. Yeah. About his mindset already, because right, that's not a normal mindset. No, you know? it's I, I tell people all the time. To me, knife is the scariest interpersonal kind of violence yeah. to deal with, um, because not just because of the weapon, but the the person. You know, if somebody that's willing to take a piece of steel and run it through skin and muscle and bone and tendon, that's very different than a dude that's willing to hold me at gunpoint. Because that guy doesn't have to touch me. He doesn't have to get bloody. He doesn't have to feel the life leave me. Yeah. None of that, you know. All right, a dude with a knife, that's a different mindset. That's a different yeah, mentality. Dude just wants to take a screwdriver and punch holes in you. Yeah. That's that's very different. And and very often we're talking about the type of person that's been there and done it before. Unless unless it's happening out of uh you know mental mental problem, mental illness. Right. Or, or it's really coming out of uh, an emotional distress and like the person is like, fuck, you know, there's nothing else to do. Yeah. So, uh, that might be the first time. But if you're talking about a criminal, somebody that's got the mindset, somebody that tells you what he's going to do and because he probably done it before, right. as he's coming towards you. I'm not talking about the guy that tells you I'm going to stab you while he's walking back. I yeah. see them every fucking weekend. And yeah. I'm like, are you going to do it from there, mate? Right. You know what I mean? So that, that's different. But... When you deal with that sort of person, now you're dealing with a person that done it before, that's not afraid of doing it, and, and straight, and probably that's good at it because you know the more you do stuff, the better you get at it. Yeah. That's some sinister shit. That that is like dealing with somebody like that. Yeah. It, it's quite sinister. I I had I had three uh, encounters in my life, and I've been lucky. I really I you know when i speak about that stuff i'm not saying oh it's not a superhero tale because yeah, yeah. there's no superhero tale man you, you and very often if you're being too cocky the universe has got its way to put you back in your place anyway so uh, i've had the, the, my first knife encounter was in latvia i was growing up in latvia i must have been about 14 years old uh, i was drinking with the locals in the village stuff that they really love to do over there and i got into it for a while you know until i realized that it's not you know it's not the best thing to do uh, we were in the kitchen uh, around it was one and a half o'clock in the morning we were in the kitchen playing cards and drinking and we had the zakuski you know the bread and all, all that stuff and one guy uh, that i didn't know i just knew the guy that uh, we were at his house mm -hmm. and he had some people over and one of the guy, I felt the vibe though, you know, but I said to myself, it's cool. I'm not alone. There's other people. But it was a guy that's been to jail before. And you could, you could, I've yeah. always been a very, I, I, I'm an empath, bro. I was born with almost a sixth sense. I can sense people, you know. And I was like, I didn't like that guy. But I thought to myself, fuck it, you know, I'm not going to speak to him too much. I'm just going to do my thing. And um, there was an argument. We were in the kitchen and there was an argument and obviously I wasn't speaking the language. They were speaking Latvian and, it, you know, I, I spoke English at that point, a little bit of Russian and I didn't know what happened. But it escalated really fucking quickly and the guy stood up and pick, picked up a massive kitchen knife and my heart started pounding in my chest. Like, I mean, that must have been one of the most scariest experience I ever had, man, you know, and uh, a lot of people that were around the table fucked off through the uh, through the door, and there was only two guys, uh, three guys left. Me, uh, the the guy that was living there, and that dude, and he was, uh, you know, he was. Uh, they were arguing, and I couldn't actually escape because they were facing the uh, the exit. Right. And what I had to do, they started fighting, and you know, what I had to do basically was to pick up a chair, not to create distance, to smash the fucking window so I could jump through it. And I jumped through the through the first uh, first story window. I hurt my ankle a little bit on the way down, but you know it, it was snowing, so it kind of amortized the. the right. And that was my first. You know, when I tell people that that was my first uh, knife encounter, 
and there is no hero story in there. I was really fucking scared. I got back home. My heart was pounding like it never did before. And it was, it gave me nightmares, bro. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, Thinking yeah. about it and it, it, you know, it gave me some sort of PTSD, that, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, no, I get it. Mate. That, and, and when you get people telling you story of how they fucking successfully blocked and disarmed the knife and you're like, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sure, man. I know. I, 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 I've only had two situations. One was with a screwdriver and one was with a pair of scissors. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I feel like I got lucky both times. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, I'll tell you, the, 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 the second time it was in Lithuania and I just came back from a shop and some guy was with a knife in his hand. It wasn't open. It was a flick knife. It was in his hand and I didn't see the knife until a certain moment. I walked towards him and he was like, what did you buy? What did you buy? I basically wanted to rub me and he wanted to mug me. And I've seen the knife in his hand because it was open, palm up. And when I did that, I had the telescopic baton on me. I took it. I, I, I put it out and the guy, his eyes went like that. And I just fucked off. I just ran yeah. away. But that was the luck again. Do you know what I mean? Because oh, yeah. never did I have to actually physically um, do something bare hands against a knife, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that was luck. It, 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 you know, a lot of it has got to do with luck. I believe that the universe is... Either it's looking after you or it's not, depending on the type of person that you are. Right. I do believe in karma. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, if it's your time, it's your time. There's fuck all you can do about it. If it's your time to go, then it's your time to go. And if you come to term with that, you know, if you meditate on death, I've been meditating on death a lot because I used to be a very unhappy kid, you know, uh, suffering of anxiety, social anxiety, and because of shit that happened to me when I was a kid. I had a lot of bad stuff happening to me. And so... You know, it was all a process, man. It was all a process. But I know now that, like, I've had a few near-death experiences induced by different, you know, different experiences. And I'm like, right, if it's my turn, it's my turn, man. You know, just accept it. Just accept it. And by accepting it, you will actually deal with the situation much better than you would if you were taken by fear. Because when that heart starts pounding and all that adrenaline kicks in, your skill, your 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 um your motor functions and your cognitive functions are so much impaired that there's there's pretty much nothing you can do. It's yeah. very easy to be petrified by fear and just stand there and get stabbed to death, man. Absolutely, for sure. Yeah. So, what what would you say? The uh, I know we we spoke about the best training methodology. Now, when it comes to weaponry, okay, just evolving a bit. Now, we we've been talking about counter weapon tactics. Now, if we speak about um, weaponry in general, using mm -hmm. weapons, I know I've always loved to learn how to use weapons, be it swords or sticks or knives or machetes or even firearms. Yeah. Um, different tools, different shapes, different use, different attributes. Um, how would you go about training mainly? Okay, just just to break, narrow things down because that's a big fucking question. But... Um, <laughs> So you got different families of weapons and different uh, categories of weapons. I always say you got either weapon by design, uh, weapon, uh, you know, improvised weapons and weapons of opportunity. Yeah. And then out of this, you have impact weapon, flexible weapon, flexible impact weapon, projectiles, shields, uh, point and edge weapons, mm -hmm. environmental weapons. Uh, and then you have explosive device, poison, chemical weapons, all that shit. But yes. basically, how would you go about What's what's the training methodology when you learn people uh, to when you teach people how to use a stick, for example, if you do some stick work or some knife work, and then yeah. we'll go on to firearms. Yeah, I, 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 our approach there is very similar, and unless it's like a very specific, like somebody's bringing me in as a subject matter expert on a thing. Um, yeah. yeah. It, it, it otherwise it's it's just an extension of everything else we do, and it goes back to all right. Learn how to fight, and, yeah. and now that you know how to fight, okay. So we're gonna put we're gonna put this baton in your hand. We're gonna put this knife in your hand. You know, um, as opposed to again, all right. We have to learn this whole new delivery system. You know, yeah. um, because again, like the average person just doesn't have time. Like they, they don't have time for that. You know, um, and the amount of time that they would have to devote to just learning that 
if it's so different than everything else that they've learned, it's not a, you know, a congruent kind of uh, program or, or delivery system. It's just not, I don't, I don't think a realistic approach, you know, um, yeah. things, even like with firearms, when we teach a firearms course, um, we put everybody on the line and we're like, okay, get into your fighting stance. People get in their fighting stance. All right. You, that that's your shooting stance now, you yeah. know, like, um, and, and, and obviously there's, there's, there's range things to deal with in terms of, of, of how close we are and whatever, but it still looks very much like what a clinch fight would look like, or what, a what, a, what, what, what we would look like if we were boxing or kickboxing or whatever, because again, I, I want people to learn how to fight mm -hmm. and if they have a weapon, okay, well now you're, you're fighting and you have a knife or you're fighting and you have a gun or, or, or yeah. whatever. Um, it's super easy for folks to, to, we talked about becoming kind of weapon focused and, and hyper focused and weapon centric on the defensive side. It's really easy for that to happen on the offensive side too, where if I have a gun or if I have a knife or if I have a baton or whatever, yeah. I forget that, well, I still have legs and I still have an elbow. I still have a head. I still have knees and, and, and these kinds of things. And so I want, I want people to, again, like, Yes, you have a force multiplier for a reason. And if you've deployed it, I assume that means that it's needed. Um, but I, I don't want to just hyper fixate on that thing. It would be it would be like, well, I, I really like my right cross. I really like my right yeah. straight. So I'm just going to keep throwing that. No matter what happens in the fight, I'm just going to keep throwing this right hand. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know that the guy's on my back now, but I'm just going to keep throwing this right hand. Like At some point... My, my, my tactics need to change. Um, and if I don't, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it would be no different than, you know, if I, if, if I've, I've drawn my gun or my knife or whatever, I, I, I need to understand that that's just an extension of who I am now. It's, it's another, it's another weapon. Like this is a weapon, like this is a weapon, like yeah. this is a weapon. Um, and, and, and I, we, we place a pretty big emphasis on understanding, look, if, if you are carrying, um, it, it is paramount that you do everything you can to try to not go hands on because I know there's at least one weapon in this conflict right now and it's mine, <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, um, shit happens, man. You know, you can slip and fall. You, no, you, you, yeah. you know, things happen and very often I, shit will happen. <laughs> it's like, yeah, and, and I, I mean, I know you just talked to Craig, um, I've done Craig's ECQC course and I oh, saw a lot of, amazing. Uh, he's fantastic. Mm. Um, and I saw a lot of guys get shot with their own guns, you know, mm. in that course, because um, I think most of the time it happened because they went to the gun and they didn't have a, they didn't have a good position to At do the wrong it. Moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the timing was wrong. Um, and, and so they ended up losing their gun, which means they ended up arming the other guy, which means the other guy shot them with their own gun. And so it, it, I, I think it goes back, and I know people get tired of hearing me saying it, but I, I think it goes back to learn how to fight. And then, okay, now yeah. let's introduce these other things. Like if you look at our system um, to, to through level six or black belt or whatever you want to call yeah. it, you know, after a level four, level five and level, level six, we almost add nothing new. It's just get really fucking good. At the funda at fundamentals, yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. You, you you say all this. It's like I always got that in mind. I like to have a different ways to do things and researching. And uh, when it comes to knife, that's one thing I can I can proudly say. Like knife is is one of my one of my specialty because I've I've been training a lot of different styles and and I've been thinking outside the box. And I realized that all these styles out there, all these knife styles, Filipino, all the Libre. I love, I love the Libre. I think it's great. I think it's got, got something great. But I find that the most efficient way to fight with a knife is to box. Yeah. It's just, just find a boxer, somebody that's good at boxing, that understand footwork, head movement, how to throw a jab across an uppercut and put two knife in his hands and ask him to do exactly the same thing. And, and, and that's essentially our approach. Like we, 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 we literally have people put a training knife in their hand and, and, and do pad work, do focus. Yeah. And, and, and if I, if I, if I, if I, if I just think about fighting the way that I would fight yeah. and I have a blade in my hand now, 
Yo, but, that, that is so dangerous. And same thing with uh, the gun. And that stuff that we used to do already uh, with my father when, when I was growing up is gun boxing. Learn to box with the muzzle of not only the muzzle, every every part of the gun can be used to to to, to impact. Sure. And so we, we had that pad work where the guy was holding pads different different angles. And you would you would box with a gun with straight or uppercuts or hooks or body shots with the with the gun, with the muzzle of the gun. So I I think that also, you know, it's like in the movie, you see people, okay. The magazine is empty, and they just throw a, a one kilogram piece of metal. Right. It's like, dude, you ha- you got a hammer, you got a you got a hammer, you got a yep. hard piece of metal in your hand that you yep. could smash somebody's skull with. Yep. You know what I mean? You you oh, might yeah, as well want to learn how to use that. And 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 we train like we well like you said. I mean, we we put people on a pad and 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 because you need to feel it because if you've never done it before and 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 you hit at the wrong angle or whatever, it will. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, and it may be that my gun malfunctions. It may be that, that in the fight in the conduct, I got dropped. It may be I'm out of me. There's a whole host of things that can happen. If it's close quarters and that dude grabs my, my, my slide, it, it's pretty easy to put a semi-automatic out of battery, you know, and, and I'm yeah. not going to have time while that dude's punching me and grabbing me and hitting me to tap rack you know, clear malfunction yeah, and yeah. get back to work. I'm going to need to, to, and, and, and it's like you said, I'm not going to sit there and try to reholster so I can fight now or toss my gun so I can fight. That's crazy. So, so, so when it comes to uh, wrestling with weapons, which is, yep. uh, that's something that we spoke about with uh, Craig because Craig is, is just amazing. I mean, that, that's really his specialty, like grappling in confined space with guns and knives. Uh, he's, he's even got this this particular type of knives that you that is just easy to to access them them little you yeah. know the little blade mm-hmm. that 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 he's he's, he's got it straight away in the hand and you know it's it's like straight away in your hand and you can you can yeah. de- you, you know you can deal with the with the person straight away from there. So what what's your what's your take on all this like grappling with weapons in confined space? Yeah, um, I mean, I, it, it's probably. 80% of what we do. Yeah, um, that's brilliant. Yeah. I need to get into that more and more. There, It's just a thing here in the UK because I hear a lot of people, you know, I, I do work with firearms, I, I, not real ones because I'm in the UK. Do you know what I mean? Sure. So I, I the, the closest I can get to that is um, soft air, air rifles, do you know what I mean? Right. Or rifles or pistol. I've got a nice collection. But... The thing is, a lot of people tell me, "Oh, you're in the UK; it's illegal here anyway. Why the fuck do you even train that stuff?" Yeah, and I'm like, "Well, you know, I, I might not live in UK all my life, or I move to the states someday, or I might move somewhere right. where it's uh, legal." And first of all, you know, the uh, criminals don't really give a fuck. They do carry weapons, so if they do carry weapons, I need to know how to use it. it it's just the prince. It's just the principle, man. It should be I, like I that. I remember one of the first times I taught in Belgium. Um, there was an active shooter in a in a in a square in the middle of a city there, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and I mean, people in Belgium don't have guns, but mm. somehow, <laughs> some way, bad guys have guns, you know. Oh yeah. Even here in the UK, they hate guns in here. I'm telling you, if you if I ring the police now and I say guns, they're gonna be here in three minutes. Top. You know what I mean? I go. I'm gonna have the armed response on my doorstep, but. Uh, you still hear you still hear stuff happening, man. In Liverpool, in here in Manchester, you get people getting shot. So you know, people that want to find uh, firearms will find them. And then you know, you got also people that are actually making them out of. Uh, yeah. When I was in Lithuania, uh, I, I bought these gas CS gas guns. Mm-hmm. So it's like a semi-automatic, but instead right. of real ammunition, it's got a CS CS gas cartridge. Yep. Uh, uh, casing and so yeah. that can actually be modified into a, a real weapon so you get people that actually are into that stuff here in the uk uh yeah i think you can turn a nine mil into a 22 or some some shit like that so mm. yeah people still find guns in here it's uh yeah. it's scary man but it is what it is i think my opinion i think that guns are not weapons once again, weapon people are weapons, not guns. Yep. So I think that everyone should be allowed to 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 carry. You know, if it was up to me, I'd be I'd be packing. I'd definitely I mean, would. It, it's similar to there. Anytime I teach um, gun defense, anything, I I take the trainer and I sit it in the middle of the mats and I, I'm like, look, 
We could stand here and stare at that thing from now until eternity, and it's never going to hurt anybody. But yeah. as soon as somebody with, with intent picks it up, now it, now it becomes an issue. But it's, not, it's still not the issue. Like, it, it's the person that's willing to do damage with it. Yeah. Um, do, 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 you, do you actually have a bit more time, or do you, do, do you need to go? Do you got, have you got a bit more time to talk? I got a couple of minutes. Yeah, oh, a couple of minutes. Yeah. 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 Cool, cool, cool. I'm just, I'm just, see, I'm just seeing you. You know, I got the feeling that you know we're already talking for two hours, man. So this, uh, we've not touched on everything, but we can do that at some other time as well if you want. That's not a problem. Yeah, um, I'm down to do it again for sure. But if you got, if you got something else for a couple of minutes, I can do it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> So I got I got quite a few more stuff, but we can like I said I'll I'll ask you a few more questions and then we can leave the rest for some other time. That's not a problem, uh, Ryan. Uh, so from a martial arts and and combative training perspective, what do you have to say about the difference between attribute development, technical development, and fight development? Because you see a lot of people are still stuck in this, uh, especially in the G Kundo, you know the the Jeet Kune Do world, and I'm not talking mm -hmm. about the Ted Wong lineage, I'm talking about the Danny Inosanto lineage, which is great as well, but there's a lot of people out there that are still stuck into the attribute and technical development phase, but they don't really uh, pressure test, they don't really do scenario training and uh, full contact simulation and stuff like that. So what, what's your take on all this? How do you actually go from attribute development to technical development, to actual fight development? How do you actually make that progression when you teach? Yeah. Um, it's, it's similar to kind of what we talked about a little bit already in, in terms of, you know, um, we, 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 we do slow walk people. Um, a lot of, of, of tactical sensitivity drills um, to get people a basic understanding of, of how to do things. Um, when we talk about, like, when we run fight classes and things like that, we start from from clinch and work our way out as opposed to, to starting in boxing or kickboxing range and working our way in. Um, yeah. I, 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 I believe that, one, it allows people to start taking some contact without it being at, at, at full range where it's daunted about getting cracked and, you know, um, whatever. So, so, so they start learning some hey, get hit and it's okay. It's not the worst thing in the world. And as we start working our way out from there, you know, yeah. punches and things can develop a little bit more amplitude and, and, and they continue to, to, to get comfortable as now we get outside of that. And then almost kind of reverse engineer it where, okay, now we've learned how to, how to fight. And now I'm going to, like in my Charlotte Center, we have um, some munition rooms. So, I mean, we have rooms. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. That's amazing, bro. I'd love to have a bedroom, that. you know, that kind of thing. And um, so now, all right, you're a jiu-jitsu guy. You you uh, have a good understanding of how to escape mount, for, for example. All right, cool. Do it on this couch. Yeah, Let, let's I've seen see that what happens here, you know, um, or do it on the on mattress or, or, or whatever. Because, again, if, if, if I am – doing what I say I'm doing, which is, you know, trying to, to offer something for the people that really need it. And if that is, is to include women and, and dealing with sexual assault and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're probably not going to be on a matted surface, you know, and, and, and doing something like shrimping or bucking and rolling or whatever on a couch or a mattress or whatever, this shit doesn't work. It just doesn't. It doesn't work. You know, you, you just sink further into the into this whatever it is that you're on. Um, and, and so but but we can't start there because I'm going to scare I'm going to scare people to death. You know, so I, I, I have to build them, I have to give them a framework. So we talk about like, all right, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the skeleton and it's up to you to kind of build the muscle around that skeleton or I'm going to give you the frame and, 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 and the paints and things, and you're going to paint the picture, but I'm not going to, it's not a paint by number. You know, I'm not going to tell you where to put the paint and that kind of thing. You have to have, do that on your own. Um, as you develop an understanding about what works and what doesn't and, and why it works and why it doesn't and, and, and the timing of it and all those kinds of things. So there has to be some level of, 
development, attribute development. Yeah. Um, but but ultimately, that that stuff I don't think matters nearly as much as your ability to uh, make decisions in real time, just based on an overall understanding of concepts and principles. And and again, you know, it, we we talked a lot about the the intent of the bad guy, but you have to have that. You have to have intent. You have to be and and sure. and be intentional about what you're doing, why you're doing it. And, and it's not just, you know, I see a lot of, especially in the rally based self-defense world, um, these, these aggression type drills, no problem with it. I, I I'm good with it. However, mm-hmm. I, I also see it as an out of control kind of, um, approach sometimes where a dude is just so aggressive, so overly, um, out of control that he's trading one danger for another, you know? And so, so, so being yeah. able to, to, to kind of, cause I think, I think there's a difference between, um, being aggressive and being out of control, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, you, you even see it in sport fighting sometimes guy comes yeah. out like just, just, and, and the dude that, that he's fighting stays nice and cool and calm and collected. And all of a sudden he yeah. cracks that guy you know, and, and because the dude is just so out of control. Um, I, I do think there has to be some level of, you know, depending on who your audience is, developing that, that aggression and that mindset. Yeah. Um, it, it's I, a bit like the yin- it can be the only thing. Yeah. It's, it's a bit like the yin yang. And when you think about it, because on one hand, I think, I mean, that's, that's how I see it. On one hand, inside, you need to stay cool, calm and collected because you need to uh, stay in control of yourself and so that you have control over your motor functions and your 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 cognitive functions right. but at the same time on the outside you need to you need to you need to be perceived as going completely fucking mental because you want to deal with the person on the psychological level but it's it's finding the right balance between the two it's acting it's almost like acting really but yeah. it should be like acting because if you fall into rage, then rage blinds. Uh, and now it's like when you said to me, uh, it, I remember about, I remember that fight between, uh, I think it was uh, Emilien- Emilienko and that big dude who was like proper aggressive from the start. And yeah. even the commentator were laughing about it, you know. And first round, he went all out. He went straight away on the hunt, like that, da, 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 da. And he got, he, he got dropped because Emilienko yeah. stayed calm and collected. Even when he was aggressive, Emilienko was just like yep. not int- disinterested, staring at the floor, like yeah, whatever. So I mean, yeah, man. I, 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 I you can watch story. early UFCs and watch Hoist. Hoist looks the same the whole time. He could be taking a yeah. beating, and he looks the same the whole time, and he's just cool and and relaxed and whatever. And inside, he may have been losing his shit. I don't know, but outside, that dude was, you know, a, a fighting a dude like Chemo, you know, that just. And, and there, there's some sparring a dude that you're giving him everything you got. And that guy's just like, it's like, fuck, yeah. dude. <laughs> like that's, scary. yeah, man. So I, I think, I think there is a finding that, that kind of balance between having good aggression, put that dude on his heel. Cause I, I, I I'm a big believer that that offense wins fights. You know, no nobody wins fights with defense. Like that's not a yeah. thing. I don't I don't well, care I this- how good your defense is. Sooner or later, you have to hit that other fucker first, or, or hit that other fucker, and 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 preferably harder than he hits you. Um, if you look at a guy like Mayweather or Pacquiao or even Lomachenko, they have great defense through head movement or footwork or some combination of the two, but they still have to win by hitting the other guy. You know, yeah. um, and, and I think when it comes to self-defense and, 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 and a little bit of tongue in cheek here, but I think when it comes to fit, self-defense, defense is for suckers, man. Like if you're defending, you're losing like that. Yeah. Th- th- there's Love no it. way around that. You know, if I'm actively blocking something that you're doing to me, I'm losing because now I'm not doing something to you. You're thinking about what you're doing to me and I'm having to re- react yeah. and respond to it. Yeah. That's not good. Um, and when we're talking about a, a, what I'm hoping is an eight or 10 second fight versus an eight or 10 round fight. Yeah. That's a, we don't have time for that. 
So for sure. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I think this is one of those things that um, is, is hard for a lot of people to grasp and, and, and understand in our industry and outside of it, you know, cause I think a lot of people in our industry get it wrong too. Mm, I think you're right, man. You know what? I mean, we, we've touched on a lot of stuff today. I, I think it was a great chat. I definitely would like to do that again with you at some point, man, whenever you sure. get the time. Obviously, I get, I, I'm intending to get a lot of people on that on that show. I, I've already got some pretty cool people. I've got some more people coming back. Uh, i got Geoff Thompson uh, Friday. That's uh, great, but man. Funny enough, we're not going to speak about fighting. We're mainly going to speak about spirituality and personal development and all the esoteric stuff, which I'm very much into as well. So yeah, uh, Jeff, we can save evolved that. We can... Jeff, Jeff has Same. really evolved over the years. Oh, yeah. You know, Jeff, Jeff yeah. is, um, uh, which I mean, you would hope that's what all of us do, right? And, you know, I, I, I hope I'm not the same person I was 30 years ago. Um, but yeah, Jeff, I, and honestly, like that, that's, that's what I would want to hear from Jeff, too. You know, um, I, he, he's, he, there's enough out there from Jeff on the, the, yeah. the fight side of things that. I've had, I've had a comment. Um, I, I posted that in a few groups and I had a comment uh, from one guy saying, why, do, why don't you, why don't you speak about, why don't you ask him about fighting? Why don't you ask him about self-protection? You know, uh, if, if it was basically somebody that doesn't understand what we're going to speak about. And yeah. I know that the stuff that we're going to speak about is. There's not a lot of people into that stuff. I mean, I, I am into esoteric practices and occult practices. I'm not into black magic or none of that shit, but I've, I've studied it. I've looked into it. Uh, but I, yeah. am I into transcendental magic and stuff like that? Fucking hell. So yes, I am. Yes, and I have been for a long time. I mean, look, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm practicing all that stuff. I have been for years, man. But as a mean for personal development, you know, to become a better person and help other sure. people do the same. So... That stuff is misunderstood by a lot of people, man. But if, if you if you're listening to it, man, it'll be uh, it'll be a deep dive into uh, the esoteric arts on Friday. So that'll be a that'll be a good one, man. Yeah, so yeah, me too, man. I met him last year uh, for the first time, and it, it was great. Uh, I've, I was lucky enough to have like a nice little little chat with him, and uh, I didn't think he was gonna reply when I uh, when I got in touch uh, with him. Because obviously he's a very busy man and he's quite popular now. It's difficult to get hold of him. And uh, I, I sent him a, a, an email and he was, oh, yeah, Julian, I remember you. Like You've asked me some pretty, sm pretty smart questions on that day. Sure, I'll do that podcast with you. I was like, fucking hell, yeah. Nice. So, yeah, that, that, that'll be good, man. I'm looking forward to it, man. Ryan, is there is there anything that you want to plug in your website, your social media, any courses that you're selling? Anything that you want to plug in? Uh, onto, on, I mean, we got courses going on all over the place, but I will say I'm I'm in Denmark next uh, next month. That's the first time I've been in years. Um, so in in Copenhagen, they want to come look at some knife stuff. Uh, we're, we're doing a little bit of edge of reality there, and I'm, I think I'm going to do some training while I'm there as well. Um, so. You know, otherwise, yeah, they can check us out on on Instagram. I think Fit to Fight Republic is probably the go for them to find all the stuff we've got going on. Okay, oh, good stuff. So, for all people right, that want to see, uh, for people that want to see this this podcast, if people didn't have the time to see it, uh, I'll, I'll put obviously the link in, in the description. But they can always go to. Uh, Adrenaline Combatives, uh, which is my YouTube channel. In the live sections, you got all the lives. If you want to see it again, if you want to share it with people, uh, I'll send you a link to that. And uh, it was great, man. Uh, hopefully, we, we we get to do that again at some point soon. I've still got a shitload of questions to go through, man. I've still got a lot of really cool stuff to, to right, speak about. I'm down. We'll do it again. No props, man. But you have a good one, uh, Ryan. Right, take care you of yourself, too. bro, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll speak very soon, man. Thanks, man. Take care, brother. Bye.